Good afternoon. My name is Grace Whiting, and I'm the president and CEO of the National Alliance for Caregiving, based in the Washington, D.C. area in the United States of America. And I am beyond thrilled to be hosting day two of the World Carers Conversation, a virtual summit on the state of caregiving in the era of COVID-19. This summit is a partnership between multiple people around the world, and it's made possible through the support of the Embracing Carers Initiative. Now, we'll go on to the next slide as we get settled in for this afternoon's conversation. And I'm very excited to just tell you a little bit about what we'll be doing. We'll start with a fireside chat feeding, featuring two global executives with international expertise in caregiving, Nadine Henningsen and Anil Patel. Then we'll move into our first session, a panel on caregiving in North America, featuring perspectives from the United States, Mexico, and Canada. We'll then hear directly about the lived experience of caregiving during COVID with insight from Debbie Harris. And then after a 10 minute break to stretch our legs or grab a cup of coffee, we'll end the day on a panel focused on caregiving in South America. It's our hope that these conversations will foster more collaboration around how we're tackling COVID-19 and how we're preparing families particularly those who care for someone with a special health care need, a disability, or long-term care concern. As you engage in this conversation, we encourage you to share your thoughts, ideas, and questions online. You can do this on Twitter using the hashtag WorldCarers. You can provide questions and comments into the chat box if you're following us on the Zoom platform. And if you're on Facebook, we'd love to hear from you there too. So please feel free to provide your insights and ideas as we engage in this conversation. Now on this next slide, we'll get started with the fireside chat. And I am just beyond thrilled to introduce two of my favorite people in the world, um, Nadine Henningsen, who is the chair of the Interna International Alliance of Care Organizations, which you may have heard to refer to as IACO. Um, in addition to this leadership role, she's also the executive director of the Canadian Home Care Association and involved in national initiatives that support advocacy awareness and the advancement of in-home care across Canada. She's worked on strategic planning, healthy systems review, human resources development, healthcare and information technology, in addition to writing numerous papers, um, participating in presentations to federal commissions and Senate committees, as well as provincial and regional planning groups on home care and caregiving related topics. She's also active as the president of the Canadian Caregiver Coalition and the chair of the advocacy committee for the Quality End of Life Care Coalition of Canada. And she is the vice president or the former vice president of the International Alliance of Care Organizations and has recently helmed the organization as chair and brought us into a new strategic planning process. She was also awarded the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal for her outstanding contribution to home care and family caregivers in 2012. I'm also very excited to introduce you to another colleague of ours, uh, Anil Patel, who has 25 years of experience in the international development sector, um, including time as a veterinarian, working in development and as a grant maker and a trustee. His experiences and his professional and personal life led him to establish Carers Worldwide in 2012, and they continue to fuel his passion to transform the lives of unpaid family carers across the globe. Anil is now the Executive Director of Carers Worldwide, which works in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh to bring about system change for family caregivers. He's the Chair of the Membership Recruitment and Engagement Committee of IACO, and an international Ashoka Fellow, um, which he was named in 2015. He's particularly interested in building an evidence base for the support for family carers in South Asia and looking at the economic impacts of caring and increasing the visibility of carers globally in order to influence policy and best practice. So I'm very excited, please, um, you know, I'm clapping here in my office, but please extend your, your warm thoughts 
towards uh, both of these wonderful people as they get us kicked off by um, with some of their initial thoughts in the fireside chat. So Anil and Nadine, if you would go ahead and turn on your videos and your speakers, and then I will fade into the background. Good afternoon, everyone. And Grace, thank you so much for inviting Anil and myself to this fireside chat. We welcome everyone into the virtual living room of IACO. The International Alliance of Care Organizations is a collaborative initiative engaging members from across the world to raise awareness, understanding, and actions for carers. Our 15 member countries, many of whom you will hear from at this virtual event, work together to share best practices, inform each other of the challenges and issues facing carers within their country, and provide leadership for a global care strategy. Our vision is to establish a global understanding and recognition of the essential role carers have with respect to care recipients, health and social care systems, and society. Our mission is to improve the quality of life and support the needs of carers through international partnerships and advocacy that strengthen and honor the voice of carers. IACO recognizes that the number of carers and the hours of care they provide is increasing. We know that across the 37 countries in the OECD, approximately 10% of adults over the age of 50 are taking on a caring role. Two thirds of these individuals are women and the male carers, the number of male carers is increasing rapidly. The majority of long-term care is provided by carers. Interestingly enough, carers account for more than twice the formal work care force in Denmark and over 10 times the size of the formal care workforce in Canada, New Zealand, the United States and the Netherlands. We all know someone either personally, socially or professionally who is a carer. And without them, our health and social care systems would be faced with increasing costs in the billions of dollars. The contributions carers make monetarily, socially, and emotionally are invaluable. But carers are often not recognized and often referred to as the invisible backbone of our health and social care systems. On behalf of the members of the International Alliance of care organizations, I am here to say that they can no longer, they must no longer be invisible. Around the world, carers come from different backgrounds, different age demographics, and different economic and social situations. There is no one size fits all. Despite the diversity, through our international work, we have recognized that carers have similar needs. So much so that five key priorities have been identified and set the frame for a global care strategy. I would like to share these five priorities and discuss a number of them with my colleague Anil Patel, as Grace mentioned, a member of IACO, but the CEO of Carers Worldwide. So let me share the care priorities. It begins with awareness and recognition. Policies and programs to increase recognition of the central role carers play in the well being of the person they care for, but in community capacity, in society, and in economic prosperity. Health and well being is a second priority. Supports that uphold carers' physical and mental health, facilitate social connections and enable carers to pursue interests outside of their caring responsibilities. The third priority is financial support. Measures to support carers' financial security and alleviate the pressure on personal finances because of caring. The fourth priority is information and knowledge. Resources to empower caregivers, but that they're appropriate for their needs and their stage within their journey. And the final priority is work and education. Practices to support supportive workplaces and educational environments so that carers have equal opportunities 
to remain in and return to work and school. As we know, and Grace mentioned, the global pandemic has impacted carers around the world. Anil and I will now explore the impact on three specific carer areas. And I'll begin. Anil, we know that through the first and subsequent waves of the pandemic, many carers have taken on new roles and many individuals have become carers for the first time. Anil, can you share some of the experiences in ensuring awareness and recognition of carers and their important contributions? Thank you, Nadine, um, about uh, IACO and uh, thanks for um, setting the scene for me to uh, talk about awareness and uh, recognition. Uh, let me take uh, uh, just 30 seconds to tell a little bit more about Carers Worldwide, what it does. Uh, as Grace has mentioned about Carers Worldwide came into being in existence uh, since 2012. Initially, we worked only with the 250 family carers in India. Since then, we have expanded into Nepal and Bangladesh, as well as uh, uh, other uh, countries We have done the feasibility study transformed the lives of more than 73,000 carers and family members. So our approach, we work through the local partner organization to implement carers worldwide model, holistically addressing social, economic, physical, and emotional needs of carers and advocating and lobbying to the local governments to achieve long-term policy change. Our close link and relationship with the local organizations and the government has meant that we were able to respond to COVID crisis and carers and their vulnerable families members were especially at risk during this time. To come back to your question, Nadine, in terms of what Carers Worldwide has done in terms of raising awareness and recognition, let me tell you at the outside, that there is no re formal recognition of carers or legislation to support them in the countries where carers worldwide is working, like Grace has mentioned, India, Nepal, and Bangladesh, or indeed most of the low and middle income countries. To raise awareness, carers worldwide has promoted carer support groups. In these countries, there are more than uh, 550 such groups have been supported at village level, cluster level, district level, and uh, uh, in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh, and particularly in India, we have promoted multi-stakeholder forums, bringing policymakers, practitioners, academicians, corporate representatives, government representatives at a state level for the raising awareness about that. So all these structures and uh, uh, regular meeting has enabled us to achieve two significant uh, uh, policy change, particularly in India. Uh, first one is Rights of Persons with Disability Act. For the first time, it highlights the issue of carers and supporting to the care, carers. And the second one being Mental Health Act 2018. Again, for the first time with our partner organization, carers and ourselves were able to influence and be right in the middle of the discussion, deliberation and dialogue. We were able to highlight uh, again, support to caregivers. In terms of uh, again, raising awareness, last five years, carers worldwide with its partner organization, we were able to celebrate Carers Day, dedicated Carers Day, to bring the media, policymakers, everyone. We have the day for everybody, but unfortunately nothing for carers. In a small way, we were able to draw that attention to. In terms of recognition of carers as a vulnerable group, which has led to inclusion of carers into existing government schemes. For example, in India, 150 days assured income guarantee scheme. Earlier carers were excluded from that, so we were able to influence in the existing grant. The second being allocation of local government budgets to fund Carers Support Act, which is example community caring centers where carers were able to bring their child or adult who require care so that they have the time to attend their sociocultural activities or go to work, earn the money, so in that way, we were able to 
uh, support. And the third being, we were holding regional and national level seminars on carers, which brought in a higher level of uh, government officials and gave carers the opportunity to speak for themselves and advocate for their needs and uh, rights to the decision makers. Finally, ongoing recognition of carers and their family members during this pandemic, making sure that uh, they could still access the pensions and other social security entitlement. Thank you. Thank you, Anil, and congratulations on moving that agenda for carers' rights. That's absolutely brilliant work. And I would, I would challenge our participants over the next couple of days to think about the importance of legislation and that legislative framework to really advance carers' recognition and awareness and carers' rights. Is it important? Is it a must? Well, how do we, how do we work together, as Anil said, to maybe land on, I, on our, or identify a global care recognition day. Wouldn't that be exciting? I think this is certainly a first step of all care organizations and interested individuals coming together over the next four days. But wouldn't it be really exciting if we could all come together for a week, a day around the world and recognize carers and the importance and role that they play. So thank you so much, Anil, for sharing some of that groundbreaking work. Around the world, COVID-19 has impacted, as we know, countries' economies and individuals' financial well-being. Carers have experienced increased and unplanned costs, unstable financial situations with limited work or layoffs, and lack of access to resources to minimize those financial burdens. Anil, can you share a little bit of your experience and what challenges or possible solutions we could look at to help carers around financial well-being? Again, thank you, Nadine, for raising that very important uh, point. One of the most talked and most worrying for carers is impact on their finances. So during this particularly COVID period, we carried out middle of the pandemic, we carried out the survey 73% of carers experienced a significant drop in household income. And in Nepal, that figure goes up to 94%. Uh, whereas uh, in Bangladesh, that figure is 84%. Carers have taught us how to produce masks and have been making them at home for use by frontline health workers in their areas, including the sanitizers as well. This is an ideal home-based activity and raises the profile of carers among, among us, the community. So we were able to engage many carers in India and uh, uh, Nepal and Bangladesh because most of the formal employment opportunities were shut down during this time. People who knew how to sew the uh, cloth. So we provided them a virtual training and supplied with the materials and they were able to uh, uh, produce a brilliant mask and we were able to distribute to the frontline health workers. Thank you. Thank you, Anil. What a wonderful example of an innovative way to address a very big challenge of minimizing financial burden. And once again, I invite all our colleagues on the call today and over the next couple of days to share your ideas or your strategies, whether they're government based, whether they come from uh, non government organizations or community based solutions. I think it takes everyone involved to really look at that financial challenges and minimize those financial burdens. Well, COVID-19 has taken a huge toll on countries' populations. We are all feeling the effects of it. And safeguarding the health and well-being of citizens, specifically those who take on an unpaid caring role, is vital during these challenging times. The new pressures of the global pandemic have impacted both the physical and mental health of carers. Increased responsibilities, unclear information, limited access to resources and respite, isolation and separation from loved ones are all realities facing carers. Anil, I know that you can share some examples and some frontline examples of things that are happening or experiences from the frontline 
to re really look at how do we safeguard the health and well-being of carers, both physically and mentally. Thank you, Nadine. Invariably, this issue comes up every time we meet with carers. 79% of carers we surveyed experienced depression and anxiety before this pandemic. But during this pandemic in Bangladesh, when we surveyed, 90% of carers we surveyed at the height of pandemic reported increase in stress, anxiety, whereas in Nepal, it was 70%. Among them, 48% carers, they said they are worried about their own health, but did not seek help because they were worried about lack of time or finances, which I highlighted earlier. So during this pandemic, what Carers Worldwide has done to reduce their anxiety, to re reduce their stress, we have connected many carers and carers leaders virtually through carers groups to spread awareness about COVID-19 prevention messages to the communities. And we have provided virtually training to the frontline health workers in terms of barefoot counseling. So they could become the first point of contact to listen to the carers issues. More than 8,500 carers have accessed our telecounseling services provided by our partners in these countries, in three countries. And we have sought the permission of our partner staff from the district authorities to collect the vital medicines and travel to deliver them to the people's doorstep. Because carers were worried if I leave my cared for individual or loved one at home, who is going to look after? Because to collect the medicine, it takes nearly four hours to eight hours. So we sought the permission and we, it's beautiful technology. We requested them to just take a photograph of the, your prescription, we send it to us and we'll go and collect your prescription and we delivered. And during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Nadine, uh, pandemic has positively highlighted the role of that carers play, the vital role that carers play. Caring has been largely invisible. You have highlighted uh, in your introduction and they play a significant role, particularly in the low and middle income countries. And now they are in the spotlight. And now is the time to bring the four, how integral carers are to the functioning of the families and also to the society. In my opinion, moving forward, Nadine, I believe that we all need to work together to transform society for carers in the same way that scientists and pharma companies across the globe have come together to find a COVID vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Anil. And, and I would concur on behalf of the members of IACO, um, I will do a, a, a quick shout out to the, the participants on this in this virtual event and, and the many, many speakers and, and thank you to Grace and, and her organization and Embracing Carers for, for uh, initiating this very, very important conversation. I will commit that the members of IACO will continue to advance on our five priorities. We will work together to increase recognition and awareness of carers uh, within our own countries, but collectively, because as we work together, we have a stronger voice. We will work on safeguarding the health and well being of carers. And a number of interesting initiatives that IACO has undertaken is one called the Innovative Care Practices, where we've profiled some very interesting models happening in Taiwan and, and France, looking at supporting the social and, and uh, emotional needs of carers. And I encourage you to please visit our website to learn more about those. We'll continue to ensure that carers have access to information and that we empower carers. We'll work with different colleagues to look at how do we create flexible workplace and education environments because no carer should have the door shut in a potential employer or certainly an educational environment because of the responsibilities they're taking on with caring. We'll also invest and work with colleagues to do research. As Anil had mentioned, it's very important to be able to collect data 
and have evidence so that we have evidence informed decision making and we are moving forward in supporting carers as, as they require and as their needs change. So for those of us who are, and those of us who will be carers in the future, for all of us around the world, the cost of caring will impact our lives. It'll, that'll impact us emotionally, economically, socially, and physically. As one carer so eloquently said, the effort is worth it. To see your loved one is comfortable, safe, and cared for but you will not come out of the experience the same person you went into it. The same holds true for all of us who are committed to addressing carers' priorities. As we work together, as Neil is encouraging us and IACO is there for us, as we work together through the formal recognition and greater respect for the value of carers, we cannot help but be changed by this journey. But that change will define us as a compassionate and caring society, where there's a global understanding and recognition of the essential role of carers with respect to care recipients, to health and social care systems, and to society. Thank you all for joining us at our fireside chat. On behalf of my colleague, Anil, and my, my me the members of the International Alliance of Carer Organizations, I wish you all the best for a safe and happy holiday. Keep up the good work and together we can make change happen. Grace, I think we're a little ahead of time, so we're happy to answer questions or if you'd like to move on to the exciting sessions that I know you have planned, we're happy to turn down our fireplace. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Nadine and Anil. Um, I appreciate you kicking us off. And there were a couple of questions. Um, one, I think that would be interesting to touch on is this issue of terminology. You know, the difference between the term carers and caregivers. And I, I have shared with the group the definition from the IACO website. But I think if you wanted to talk a little bit about what do we mean when we say carer or caregiver? And uh, Anil, I'll start if I may, and then I'll pass the baton over to you. Um, Grace and, and, and uh, the participant, what a, a brilliant challenge. It really is a challenge. Um, imagine I, as Grace mentioned, I head up the Canadian uh, Carers Organization. And in Canada, we call these individuals caregivers. We call them family caregivers. Uh, globally, we call them carers. Uh, IACO is actually putting together a global state of caring report where we're profiling 18 different countries. And on the first page of every country, we actually say what term is used within that country to reference carers and then the definition. I think Grace, that as a collective, we all are looking to support that individual who has taken on that unpaid caring role to look after their loved one. Every situation is very different. And to be quite candid, it doesn't matter what we call them. As long as we agree and we commit to moving key priorities, to listening to carers, to understanding what are their unique needs, irregardless of what the care recipient needs, what is it the carers are looking for, and how can we support these absolutely invaluable people? One of my favorite sayings to my colleagues here in Canada and internationally is, it's not if you're going to be a caregiver, it's when. So let's all buckle up and not worry about the terminology, but we can all move things forward. Anil. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, I don't know uh, what else I can add to you. You uh, said uh, everything about it. Let me tell you what carers worldwide uses. We use a very broad definition of uh, carers. What we mean by carers is an any individual of any age who care for or nurses a relative, friend or a partner requiring this help due to physical, mental ill health, disability, old age, fragility, substance misuse, or any other cause. In low and middle income countries, they are invisible as we highlighted earlier. They are most isolated because of caring responsibility. They're unable to take part in the social cultural activities and they're most vulnerable. 
So that is the definition. As you say, Nadeen, it is most important thing for us is to understand, to listen, provide them an opportunity to share their feelings, their issues, their concerns, and design and develop a solution which is appropriate to their needs. That is most important rather than terminology, whether it is caregivers or carers, end of the day, they are human beings. They have the same right as others. So how do we come together to address that challenge? So one additional uh, question, uh, just as we're kicking off this week and something that came up yesterday as we were talking with uh, Cameron James, who uh, is a singer and a songwriter and, and a carer herself. And that is, this is such a difficult time for so many and many communities, people are having to go back into quarantine or back into lockdown and they're not feeling very hopeful. Um, now, of course, the news of a, of a vaccine on the horizon, I think, has energized many. But I wonder what advice you would give to a carer who is at home right now and who is worried about the future ahead. What advice would you give to them? And maybe, Anil, if you want to start, and then um, Nadine, you'll have the last word. Thank you, Grace. Uh, three things I would like to advise. Uh, please don't keep yourself, whatever you are feeling, talk to your neighbors or somebody, relatives whom you have trust and confidence. They respect your views, your privacy. So please, whether it is virtual or uh, neighbor meeting physically, that is one thing. And second is, I know it is, very difficult, carers feel guilty about talking about their own health and well-being. It is so important, please make sure 10 minutes in a day to look after yourself. As we all know that when you are taking a flight before taking off, there is an announcement that uh, if there is a low oxygen in the cabin, please put mask on yourself before helping others. So it is so important for carers to understand that. and. Uh, Third and most important is uh, engage in some kind of productive work, also the care for individuals, so that you are not constantly worried and thinking about uh, what is going to happen tomorrow if something happens to me. Thank you. And Anil, I would definitely concur with all three of those recommendations. I think I would share with carers, uh, certainly from the experience and, and the conversations that we have around the international table at IACO is one is you're not alone. Um, although sometimes it feels very isolating and that you are, are, and your situation is unique, but there are people surrounding you. There are many people working for and on your behalf. You are appreciated. Everything you do is appreciated 10 times over. So, so sometimes when you just feel like giving up, just take, as Anil said, take five minutes, take a deep breath, and you are very, very much, the work you do, the silent work you do is very appreciated. And organizations like IACO is going to try to raise your voice so that it's no longer silent. And last but not least, and I hate to say this, but Canadians, we tend to, to see things always on the positive side. It's just who we are, probably because we have such a long winter that we have to uh, see things on the positive side. But I would say that the challenges that we're facing right now are going to make us stronger. They're going to facilitate sessions like this. They're going to get organizations that we would have never chatted in a normal world together. We are now chatting and, and, and working together to advance common priorities. So as an individual care, as you're going through these challenges, as you make in innovative ways to be able to meet your needs and your loved one's needs, these challenges will end up making us stronger. So no, you're not alone and we will stay connected. Wonderful. Well, I want to extend a warm uh, thank you to you both for being here and, and thank you for bringing a beautiful fireside <laughs> for the conversation. Um, it was wonderful to have you to kick today off. So thank you very much um, for being here. We appreciate it. Thank so you for so those, much, Grace. Thank you. Thank you, Grace.
So for those of you who are following along, we're actually going to launch a poll while our next panel um, gets together. So our next panel, if our panelists would start to take themselves um, off of mute and off of their video, and I'm going to go ahead and launch um, this poll. And this is a poll we've been asking. Um, you know, we started yesterday. Um, so just to indicate, you know, what part of the world are you joining us from? And then a second piece, in what ways has COVID-19 impacted um, families in your country of residency? So um, if you get a chance, if you want to go ahead and, um, and participate by, and I can see some some of that feedback is coming in now. We also have a question, uh, what is your primary role? You know, so how, how do you care for others? Likewise, we've been getting some wonderful comments here in the Q&A box. So please feel free to continue to share your comments and questions and ideas. Um, for this next panel, we will also have a Q&A portion. So as you're listening to the speakers, we encourage you to, to listen in and, and, to, um, and to ask questions uh, as well. So I think all of our speakers have assembled and we have a awesome panel. Um, so uh, let me just tell you a little bit about who we're about to hear from. So first we'll hear from Ai Jen Pu, who is the co-founder and executive director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization that works to bring quality work, dignity and fairness to the growing number of workers who care and clean in our homes. And in addition to that, Ijin is also uh, had launched in 2011, Caring Across Generations, which unites American families in a campaign to achieve bold solutions to the nation's crumbling care infrastructure. And I would just say that between these two organizations, Ijin has an amazing understanding of what it is to take care of each other and the ecosystems between the paid care workforce and the unpaid care force, uh, work, care workforce. She has, in her time with Caring Across Generations, worked on policy change, including the fa first family caregiver benefit in Hawaii, the first long-term care social insurance fund in Washington state. She's also written a widely acclaimed book, The Age of Dignity, Preparing for the Elder Boom and a Changing America, which helps people Americans and others to make meaning of the need and opportunity in the elder boom, including improving the access to care for all families and ensuring a strong care workforce for the future. She's a political activist um, and has worked with such greats, uh, names you might remember, such as Gloria Steinem, who called her book an urgent and irresistible book and um, underscored that the importance of people getting older is not a crisis but a blessing. She's also worked uh, to co-found Supermajority, which is a home for women's activism, training, and mobilizing a multiracial intergenerational community to fight for gender equity together. And she's been recognized among Fortune 50's world's greatest leaders, Times 100 most influential people in the world, and has won numerous other awards, including a 2014 MacArthur Genius Award and um, absolutely brilliant, wonderful, humble, and uh, is our moderator today and will be helping to set the stage for the discussion. Our second speaker is gonna be Susan Reinhardt, who is a member of the board of directors of the National Alliance for Caregiving. And um, abs again, another brilliant, wonderful advocate. She is a nurse by background. In addition to having a PhD, she directs the AARP Public Policy Institute, and she's the chief strategist for the Center to Champion Nursing in America. She has worked on health security, financial security, family, home, and community issues, and is the editor in chief of Policy Plus Action, which is the AARP Public Policy Institute newsletter. She's also a nationally recognized expert in health and long term care. She has served previously as co director at Rutgers their Center for State Health Policy and has worked on national initiatives to help people with disabilities live at home. She served three governors as deputy commissioner at the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services and her research and policy expertise includes the healthcare workforce, caregiving, consumer choice, community care options and quality. She's also been a faculty member at Rutgers 
College of Nursing and is an American Academy of Nursing Fellow. Our third speaker is Catherine Surgeon, who is the Director of Policy and Knowledge Translation at the Canadian Home Care Association and Carers Canada. She focuses on advocacy and strategic partnerships, knowledge translation, and works to promote awareness and discussion of the often overlooked needs of family caregivers across Canada. For the past six years, Catherine has developed and coordinated the annual Pan-Canadian Awareness Campaign, including National Caregiver Day, that resulted in the engagement of more than 2,000 people, collaborations with more than 200 partner organizations, the involvement of more than 40 members of the Canadian Parliament, and federal endorsements from the Prime Minister, the Minister of Seniors, and the Minister of Health. She has also led the launch of the Innovative Carers Practices work, which is work to identify evidence-informed models that can support physical and psychosocial needs of caregivers. And those practices have been shared widely across Canada, the UK, Ireland, France, Taiwan, and 10 other nations. She also supports the communication function of the International Alliance of Care Organizations and is a key member of the Policy and Stakeholder Relations Committee. And last but not least, we have um, Carlos Castro, who is joining us, um, representing a number of different groups in Mexico. And um, he has been working in caring and caregiving related issues. And first we met him through um, the International Heart Health Hub. And so he's a, an innovator, a brilliant mind. Um, and he got into this type of work after the death of his grandson, Alejandro. Um, and then he, with his daughter, Adriana, um, their husband and his wife, founded the Association ALE, which is a nonprofit organization that promotes organ donor culture and public awareness. It provides financial assistance for the Mexican population and for those who don't have medical aid to access transplant medicine. They currently work in public policies, including kidney and cardiovascular diseases, and to have in Mexico um, advocating for universal health care. Um, he's also participated in numerous global conferences and forums nationally, um, in addition to his global work, and has spoken as the voice of the patient as an important stakeholder in decisions on public health. He's the co-author of a book which proposes new policies for kidney disease in Mexico, and the president of several different coalitions, including um, past president of the Board of Trustees for IHUB, um, member of the board and president-elect of the IFKF International Federation of Kidney Foundations and other wonderful organizations. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to iGen to kick us off uh, with today's discussion on caregiving in North America. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you for your leadership on behalf of caregivers. And it is truly my honor to be with you and be a part of this conversation. As Grace mentioned, I'm Ai Jen Pu, and I'm the director of Caring Across Generations. We are a national campaign to uplift the value of caregiving and support our caregivers in the United States through culture and policy change. And I'm really proud to welcome the first panel in this conversation to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on unpaid caregivers in North America. As Grace mentioned, we do have a phenomenal lineup of expert panelists from the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And I'll just say that this panel is incredibly timely as we are still in the midst of a raging pandemic and family caregivers have truly borne the brunt of navigating the crisis for families, often in isolation, having to make impossible choices while providing essential care for some of the people most vulnerable to the virus itself. And I think we would all agree that not enough has been done to honor and support our caregivers in this time. For those of you watching today who are caregivers, we want to start by just saying that we are so grateful for all that you have done and continue to do to provide essential care. We see you, we are you, and we honor you. Thank you for everything that you're doing and holding right now. 
Um, I think all of us would agree that addressing the needs of caregivers must be central to how we both survive the pandemic and recover economically and otherwise. The crisis has revealed just how little we have in place to support our caregivers to our collective peril, exacerbating every inequity in our society from massive numbers of women leaving the formal workforce due to caregiving challenges, to the racial inequities that have disproportionately devastated black, indigenous, migrant, and other communities of color in the pandemic, to the incredible risks to our public health when caregivers are unable to provide the essential services safely with the support that they need and deserve. We have a unique once in several gener generations opportunity now to change how we value and support caregivers across North, North America. As the entire continent has awakened to what we've known all along, which is how essential the work of unpaid caregivers truly is. Recognizing that caregiving is not only the foundation of our families, but of the safety, health, and well being of our economies, of our societies. As fundamental as the roads, transportation systems, and broadband, caregivers are the human infrastructure that makes everything else possible in society. And I can think of no better first step to economic recovery than to ensure that our caregivers are supported, to enable the rest of our societies to get back to work and to recover into a more equitable caring future for our families. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from our brilliant panelists today about how we seize this moment of crisis and opportunity to support our caregivers. And we're gonna begin with Susan Reinhardt who will discuss the challenges facing family caregivers in the United States. Susan, take it away. Thank you. So I guess I need to get this poll off. So, um, I think you can see that I'm not really sitting on a beach. I don't know if you can see that, <laughs> but I live in New Jersey, uh, which is, and, and I live a mile from the beach. So this is my happy place. Rather than having um, a fireplace behind me, I just like to see an ocean. Thank you for having me. Um, this first slide, this first picture is the cover of a report called Home Alone Revisited. And it gets to my first point about what has been happening with family caregivers before COVID and certainly sense, which is that the role of family caregivers has grown enormously in providing complex care. Uh, this report talked about more than 40 million caregivers in the United States, and half of them are already doing that, again, before COVID. And when we call complex care, I mean, this can include ventilator care, certainly lots of injections, in, uh, lots of medications and injections, wound care, uh, many, many different things that typically nurses had done, maybe other healthcare professionals that they have been taken on themselves. And we call these medical nursing tasks for want of a better term or complex care tasks. Uh, but they, the big problem is that you can see there's somebody there in the picture with an IV intravenous with a intravenous bag hanging. And here's the caregiver coming to hang another bag. Um, who taught her how to do that? You know, most of them say that they have not been given very good instructions and that they feel worried about making a mistake. Um, so again, this is the findings before COVID. These, this was released uh, last April. Um, but right now I can tell you my own story of my sister who uh, in May uh, wound up in the hospital with a ruptured appendix because she wouldn't go beforehand and she has lupus and she was terrified of getting COVID. So that it's not just getting the COVID, it's those people were not getting the care that they should be getting because they were afraid to go to a hospital. So she almost died, literally. She was not allowed to have anyone there. She, a week later, uh, thank God, she was released from the hospital with a drain, a very serious drain. Her husband was terrified, the caregiver, terrified of this thing. And so what happens? She didn't get instruction. Well, she herself is a master's prepared social worker. She can figure some things out, but she had already started into delirium because she didn't have people with her 
She was terrified. They were giving her pain medication because of this terrible situation. And the pain medication tripped her into delirium. This is not an unusual story I'm telling you. It's just my sister's story. Now, she, I'm a nurse, as you just heard, and my other sister's a nurse. And there's such a thing as FaceTime. So we could, you know, communicate and help in ways and actually see the wound. But most people don't have that. So family caregivers are dealing with these very complicated, scary things. But there are things that they can do or that we can do. So if we want to get to solutions. I can tell you that we are trying with videos. There are things that we could talk more about solutions. Maybe you want to do that later, Ajen. Uh, but there are things that we can do not just now, but in the future to help family caregivers manage this. The second thing, if you go to the second slide, because I know I don't have that much time, is a blog that I wrote with some others that family caregivers are not just visitors. And it, it focused in on the challenges in hospitals, this, but this is continuing, of course, in nursing homes, of family members not being able to visit the person that they're caring for. And that's particularly problematic when the person has dementia or some kind of other cognitive decline. And again, the uh, agitation and delirium. So uh, what we have found is that some, this was about hospitals, hospitals have been able to uh, try to bridge that. They found themselves when family members didn't come because they couldn't come, they did find, that, I'm talking about nurses and physicians and other healthcare professionals inside the hospital realized in terms of uh, recognition how important those family members were to be able to give them information, to be able to get a glass of water, to be able to help them do things, not only the social support, but a lot of physical things that family members do when they're visiting. And so the staff started saying like, oh my God, these people really are important to us. So they are starting to realize that. And again, trying to balance that infection risk with person and family centered care. How do we do this? And how do we have protocols for crises, but also protocols for all the other times? How do we bring people in, into, uh, into not just hospitals? One of our uh, physicians, Dr. Kevin Bees from North Carolina said, COVID-19 is not a surge, it's a siege. And so, uh, you know, trying to deal with this, um, he felt was also an opportunity to really get across to those that don't understand that family caregivers are really, really important. The third one, third point I wanted to make is if we can go to the next slide, is that social isolation or extended isolation is killing older adults in long-term care. There's increasing evidence around this. We've known that um, isolation, uh, by the way, we found that isolation costs Medicare in the United States about $6.7 billion a year. So it costs it's money, financial money, but it's devastating to the to, uh, people. Feelings of loneliness, abandonment, despair, and fear takes a toll on both physical and neur neurological health. Um, people who are feeling this are about 50% increased risk of dementia, 32% risk of stroke, and fourfold, fourfold increase in death among heart, fa uh, heart failure patients. So this is pretty serious. And again, this is you know, not just COVID, this is COVID in general. Um, so we, in some places were able to try to deal with technological solutions, you know, iPads, you know, the phones and what have you, and really trying, of course, not everyone can use a phone. There's not enough staff to deal with everything to do this. So again, hospitals have to do a better job of planning and their technology platforms. Those hospitals in the United States that are more uh, resourced, have done a better job with that. But again, the recognition, I really appreciate those five priorities, just the recognition first, and then trying to come up with solutions. Um, we have started to see that, again, because of this under, better understanding of the role of family caregivers in general, that some hospitals uh, and nursing homes, but more we've seen this in acute care, too, are starting to create uh, programs that they want to continue after COVID too. Like one of them created a virtual, vis a, a virtual vigil program so that they have a virtual coordinators and they had a hundred different um, volunteers that would sit with someone in, in the hospital in this case 
24 seven, they made sure that the family could have access to the person. This is an end of life program, 24 seven. This is at Advocate Aurora Health in Illinois and Wisconsin. Well, you know, hopefully that's not going to continue where it's only virtual, but it did bring in other family members who would never been able to be there anyway, because they lived too far apart or they, or they were international. This was something that could be global and bringing families together. So there are other benefits that could be uh, happening at the time uh, and, and certain, not just at end of life, it could be happening more generally to bring more people into the social support network for older people, whether it's acute care or long-term care. So I'll leave it at that because I know that we're keeping things short and you can come back to me if you need to. We absolutely will, Susan. Thank you so much for sharing all that really, really vital information. Um, and I'm going to now bring in our colleague from Canada, um, Catherine Surajan, who will share her analysis of what's happening um, with family caregivers in Canada. And after our next two panelists speak, we're gonna bring everybody back together to continue to digest some of these challenges and also move us towards solutions. So I'm really excited for the conversation. Catherine, take it away. Thank you, Aichen. Hello, everybody. So my name is Catherine Surajan, and I am the Director of Policy and Knowledge Translation at Caris Canada. And I'm very delighted to join all of you today. So as Aichen mentioned, I'll be sharing the impact of COVID-19 on our Canadian caregivers, as well as what we can do to empower them through the, the pandemic and beyond. And can we go to the next slide, please? So CARES Canada, along with our provincial caregiver organizations across Canada, we exist to increase awareness and advocate for the Canadians 8.1 million caregivers, and that's one in four Canadians. Under normal circumstances, our caregivers already contribute 66.5 billion in unpaid labor per year to our healthcare system. They provide 80% of care to the vulnerable and most at-risk people in our communities. And 50% of them are between the ages of 45 to 65. That means they are in the sandwich generation, they're balancing work and care, and they themselves may have long-term condition themselves that increase their vulnerability. As you know, and some of the other panelists have mentioned, each caregivers have their unique experiences. And this made up of what they know, which is the head, how they feel, the heart, and what they do, their hands. Similar to caregivers around the world, the pandemic has really increased the pressure that our family and friend caregivers are already facing on a daily basis. Across Canada, as a primary defense to limit the spread of COVID-19 and overwhelming our healthcare resources, there were sudden shuttering of home care and support services to individuals' home, their full lockdown of what, what are deemed to be non-essential services, and restricted access to families in long-term care or retirement, retirement homes, similar to what Susan has shared as well. While these measures may have had good intentions, they have overlooked the dependency we have on our caregivers as well as their needs. Due to COVID-19, many of Canadian caregivers, they have to do more with even less. To recognize, understand, and support our caregivers, we look to understand the extent that COVID has impacted our caregivers through the head heart and hence lens. So now when I say the head, I refer to the caregiver's knowledge, their level of understanding and whether they have the right information that they need to feel in control of their situation. Major challenges because of COVID-19 has been ensuring that their loved one continues to receive the care that they need as services are being rationed but also how to look after their own needs. So what we learned through our surveys uh, that the provinces have done is that caregivers across Canada are more in need of respite during the pandemic, but they have a harder time getting a break. And as you guys probably experience, in, experience yourself as well, over the past nine months, there has been a 
overwhelming amount of information and changing regulations. Our caregivers, they are trying to make sense what is happening, but also what will happen. With the rapid change and amount of information, it becomes very difficult for them to know what is the right information, what services are available, who do I call in, in emergency, where do I go for information, as well as what do I have to do. As they take on more caregiving responsibilities, it also meant that it became more difficult for them to manage caregiving with the work and family responsibilities. The pandemic has also noticeably increased the financial impact for caregivers where they have used their own savings to help pay for expenses related to caregiving. So the second component, the element that we try to understand from the caregiver experience is the heart. And the heart of caregiving, it refers to the emotions in which they experience their caregiving um, journey and shape their sense of well-being. The mental health of caregivers has always been a concern, but it has been amplified due to COVID-19. Our caregivers are feeling overwhelmed, frustrated, and anxious. And as I mentioned before, part of it is also to making, because they want to make sure that the need of the person they care for are being met during, us, during iso isolation, as well as protecting themselves and other family members. But many caregivers, they're also dealing with their own isolation, including not being able to see others and feeling lonely, feeling alone, feeling like they're in this all by themselves. And while some were already exhausted before all of this COVID-19 happening, the COVID-19 crisis increased the psychological and the physical exhaustion. And the hands of caregiving refers to the different caregiving tasks. Adapting to COVID-19, caregivers have to quickly adapt and learn necessarily skill to take on new tasks. So as, mentioned, as Susan mentioned, a lot of it is also dealing with having the right skills to do complex care tasks. But what we learn through COVID-19 is that they're also providing more hours being spent providing emotional and behavioral support. In addition to that, knowing how to use new or unfamiliar technologies as well as managing at a distance. Next slide, please. So across Canada, policies and resources are, are being put in place to better support caregivers. But what we're also doing here in Canada is that there's an increasing focus of using emotional intelligence to ensure person and family centered care is effective. So as I mentioned before, is that caregivers, you know, there may be supports available out there, but what we heard from some of our caregivers is that they don't necessarily know how to access the support or they don't necessarily feel the support from our system. So to complement the supports that are available out there, we're also building on the role of EQ in engaging and empowering caregivers by meeting at where the caregivers are at where their knowledge are at, what are their feelings, as well as the skills. Hi higher competencies in emotional intelligence will help healthcare leaders to be aware of their own emotions and the impact that they have on those around them. Understanding caregivers' emotions and appreciate what, how, and why they feel the way they do. And by having the understanding, they'll be able to respond to the unique experiences of each caregiver. Being able to manage their own emotions and personal biases by being flexible in their approach or habit to respond appropriately to caregivers' values, wishes, and individual needs as well as using emotions their own as well as the family caregivers in a positive way. Understanding the role of emotions in shared decision making and to guide and mentor our caregivers in a way that meets their learning style. So by using emotionally intelligent skills and behaviors, such as active listening, empathy, problem solving, coaching, and flexibility, healthcare providers can support our caregivers to cope more effectively to the unexpected challenges and new issues re resulting from COVID-19. So to not only making sure that they feel the support we intend to give them, 
but also to support them in a way that they need. Next slide, please. And I want to end by recognizing our caregiver organizations across Canada who spoke with caregivers in their jurisdictions to better understand their experience within their context since the pandemic hit and has quickly pivoted to develop programs and services in collaboration with caregivers for caregivers. Our provincial caregiver organizations, they quickly mobilized, adapted, and increased their programs and services to reflect the new realities that caregivers were facing because of the pandemic. And I want to end my slide by a statement that we always say, which is a simple act of caring creates an endless ripple. Caregivers take pride in their role, and we all must step up to make sure that they are also taken care of too. Thank you. Absolutely. What a beautiful slogan to create endless ripples of good in the world. Thank you for that, Catherine. Um, next, we're going to hear from Carlos Castro Sanchez from Mexico, who will discuss some of the incredible challenges, but also opportunities to support caregivers in Mexico. Uh, Mexico can no longer uh, avoid the caregivers work that is being done right now. COVID has exposed us too much in our negligence of how to respect and have sensitivity towards this, uh, this group of population that is doing such a wonderful work. Next slide, please. Mexico, like the rest of the world is aging, but we have one particular uh, issue, which is we have a lot of people who are disabled. In Mexico, 6 million people are disabled. 19 of the 100 homes of Mexico have a disabled person. And most of them are because of accidents. We have a great profession to, to accidents, but this also is the one that this require more participation of caregiving. Only less than 1% of the elderly dependent people in Mexico reside on a public or private institution. The rest are still home receiving family care. The non-paid caregiver services were valued in 2018 of 1.5 percentage of our gross domestic product. Mexico is aging. We have a lot of population which is disabled. So this is really the great work that is being done by caregivers. The next slide, please. And I want to show you what is the profile of the Mexican caregiver. 70% of Mexican caregivers are female gender. Average age is 48 years. They are married women. They are unemployed. They are the daughters of the patient or the people who need of care. They have incomplete grammar school. They are without training and they live in the same house as the patient or the patient in need of care. We do have 2,000, 3 million people of the elderly with dependents. Of them only receive, 41% of them do receive dependents care only 41% of the Mexican population. The next slide, please. We don't have a caregiver's policy. We have avoided this issue for many, many years. I have tried to look into Mexican law and there is not a piece of legislation that mention, mentions the word caregivers. It's not in the Mexican health law. It's not in the Mexican social development law. It's not in the Mexican law for the rights of the elderly, and it's not in the Mexican social security law. Or Mexico has never adopted international agreements. For example, the Declaration for Human Rights Protection of the Elderly People proclaimed by the Organization of American States in 2015 by recommendation of the World Health Organization. And finally, finally, on August of 2018, an agreement was published in our biggest uh, health organization to establish actions for the design 
and implementation of public health policy for long-term services for carers in public institutions of our national health system. But nevertheless, nothing has been done since then. Next slide, please. Conclusions. Mexico needs a new model for people in the need of care. We must move from the perspective of charity and benefits to a perspective of rights. The burden of time and expenses is supported almost entirely by the family. It is urgent a network of professional caregivers to assist 9 million people, 2.4 million already independent, and this will continue to grow. Training in basic care and or the pathological process of the people that need care is essential. This affects the adequate provision of quality care and will help in the great risk of burnout. The institutional transition would require a significant budget effort, a great challenge, but it can also be done if we have political will. So far, it is not being shown. Family cares, and this has been said by my the other people who spoke, family care must also receive a financial incentive. These needs cannot longer be postponed and requires a Mexican reform to Mexican health law. And with this, I conclude that I'm not proud of what is happening in our country, but this is giving me the window of opportunity to initiate a full drive to finally have a Mexican public policy for family caregivers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carlos. Um, I feel like we've seen all four of you have painted a really, um, a really complex and comprehensive picture of what our caregivers in North America are facing. And I'm curious, and this is a question for all of our panelists, um, do you feel that there has been adequate recognition of the role of caregivers in your countries? And what will be required to move from a place of recognition? In the United States, we've been applauding our essential workers and recognizing them, but we haven't actually done much to protect them. What will be required to move from a place of recognition to real action on the part of policymakers and leaders across sectors? Um, why don't we start with you, Catherine? Good question. Um, so in Canada, there is increasingly recognition of family caregivers, but I have to say that the recognition just still need there's still a lot more to be done because I find a lot of time the recognition of caregivers is still being tied as a function of the patients. Well, they are their own individual with their own needs. And I think that with our recognition to just because understanding with the different impacts that caregiving are making, not to just our health and social care, but also financially to community as a whole. With Canada, we're trying to increase recognition where regardless of where you are and your role, there is, you will know a caregiver and there is something that you can do to create a more caregiver friendly policies, whether it's uh, within healthcare policies or is it within your work and as well as within the community unity. Yes. Mm -hmm. What about you, Susan? What are your thoughts on this? Um, there has been increasing recognition. Um, certainly Grace and her coalition across the country has been a big part of that and many other organizations in the United States. Of course, it's not where we want it to be, but we are making pretty significant progress. We detailed that in a recent report called Valuing the Invaluable about the kinds of things we've been seeing a couple of things we think have been helping. First of all, there are more family caregivers, so more people in Congress, for example, are caregivers themselves, including men. Uh, men there are 40% of caregivers are men, so it, it's becoming not only a woman's issue in the United States, which helps, I think. We've also pointed that one in four caregivers is a millennial. So trying, to, it's true, just as was reported in Mexico, the average age is still 48, but we've been unpacking that. We really feel that it's important to show the diversity of family caregiving rather than the averages, including multicultural caregivers, 
um, income, et cetera. So we've been trying to, because people won't see themselves in an average. So that's been, I think, helping. Uh, Congress also, again, with the help from ARP, but other organizations created a caucus, they call it for caregiving. So that is, there's a political bipartisan, by the way, base uh, of support at the federal level. And at the state level, there's been many um, different policies that have been passed. We've been tracking that at ARP. Uh, one of them was because of this home alone research that I pointed to, the advocacy world in ARP and others uh, passed the CARE Act. That's not the CARES, but the CARE Act saying that family caregivers needed to be recognized in hospitals. You have to ask every patient that is admitted, regardless of their age or diagnosis, whether they have someone who's gonna be helping them. And then do they want that person's name in the, fam in the record, the medical record? And if they do, with permission of the patient, then you need to offer them guidance. And that is now passed in almost every state in the United States. So it's like you going at the local level, the state level, the federal level, and gaining as much um, bipartisan support politically. That's right. That sounds right to me. Let's make it happen. <laughs> Carlos, what about Mexico? Well, Mexico, even though it's part of North America and we do have a trade agreement between the three countries, uh, we still have not put in place the components of the social determinants of uh, population. The inequalities of, uh, uh, of uh, the economies of each individual person. So when you ask the question, what should we do to gain recognition? Well, at least what we have to is to put in place not only the necessity because the family or because of this social determinant is doing the work of family caregivers and they do it with such love and such uh, and, 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 and such uh, respect for the people they care for. But we definitely must elevate with the window of opportunity that COVID is giving us now, we must put it in the political arena. So we definitely have to put it in the political arena because it's a necessity. And if we want to be a player, like we're playing with Canada and the United States on the economic front, we also have to be a player also on the social programs that are needed. And that this Mexican population, especially the vulnerable ones, the poor ones need is recognition of the great work they do to taking care of their families. Thank you, Carlos. I'm wondering if any of you are aware of efforts to ensure that caregivers are among the first to receive access to the vaccine as it comes to your countries. No. No, no, there's no efforts. <laughs> Not to my knowledge. I, 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 it's definitely people in nursing homes, mm -hmm. but that's paid, well, paid caregivers, yes, but not unpaid family caregivers, not mm -hmm. to my knowledge. Maybe Grace knows something I don't know, but I'm not aware of that. Yeah, well, that's, that's a million dollar question, right? And in Canada, caregivers are being recognized under for the long-term care, so more on the concrete settings, but at the same time, it's still uh, whether it's a guideline by our federal leaders and it's up to the provincial, um, I guess, interpretations to make sure that they actually consider family and friend caregivers in that bucket. So the intention is there, but yeah, more work needs to be done to make sure that our family caregivers actually get them and especially the one in the community too, right? Because most of our family caregivers are in the community. Mm -hmm. In, Mexico they, in mm -hmm. Mexico, they had, uh, they just published last Friday how they're going to be distributing the vaccine. And the first ones are going to be the, the people who work on, on health services. They're going to be the ones who will receive the, uh, the vaccination first. But nothing else, only the elderly will be receiving on, on, on the beginning of 2021 uh, the, the vaccination, but nothing. Well, n nobody talks about caregivers, so it's not an issue if we have them or not. On, on vaccines. So it seems like we have a long way to go, even on the level of recognition of caregivers and talking about caregivers in the public discourse in Mexico. Yes. 
Grace, did you want to chime in here? Grace, maybe Grace. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so in the United States, it's interesting because, you know, we have a system with states, or you know, in some countries, you might call them provinces. Um, so each state, on, under our constitution, for the most part, healthcare is sort of a mixed responsibility of our federal government and our state governments. And so each state is responsible for developing a priority list under the Centers for Disease Control to determine who will get the vaccine first when it becomes available. Um, there has been efforts at the national level to, to provide public comment into the advisory committee that looks at vaccine policies in the United States. And there are people who have been advocating there for early access, um, but it's a very hotly contested uh, topic area. I mean, everybody from the association that represents the Santa Claus at the mall from, you know, nurses and healthcare providers to any, anything in between has been asking for early access. And so at least what we're seeing, I think, in the United States is it's really critical that those frontline workers and nurses and the doctors and home care workers and others get access and um, we're hopeful that caregivers will be a part of that, but it's too soon to tell. Thank you so much for that context. Very helpful. Um, I, in our remaining five minutes, I would love to hear, I know each of you is working on a range of solutions to support caregivers in your countries. And I um, would love for us to do a closing go around. If you would just name one solution that if you could move it forward in your country tomorrow would be your top priority or something you think could be game-changing for caregivers. And I'll start this time with Carlos. Uh, Mexico has a, a, a policy to give a check every month to uh, all people. So I would, if I had the position of this, I would give the same amount of money that is giving to all people, which is 2,000 pesos per month for all people, I would ask our Mexican government to give 2,000 pesos per month. It's only $100 a month for the people who take care of their family. I would definitely ask for budget to have this part of the social programs that are being implemented right now. Very clear. What about you, Catherine? Um, I'll reiterate the key point that I wanted to portray through my presentation, which is continue building our healthcare providers capacity around emotional intelligence so that they know how to support our family caregivers, identify, understand and support them in a way that needs them that really address their head, heart and hands need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we've got financial assistance in Mexico. We've got social and emotional training in Canada. What about the US, Susan? I'd like to get the COVID relief package passed, which has a lot of things in it, including financial. On top of that, I would like to see more instruction given, for not just around COVID. I mentioned we have videos that we've been creating at ARP. Others could do the same, but we need really concrete help and help, how to help people know what the heck they're doing so that they don't feel so worried. Yes, agree. And on that note, um, at the National Domestic Workers Alliance, we've partnered with a group called Leading Age um, to create a COVID-ready caregiver training program, which is a set of resources to assist caregivers, both professional and unpaid family caregivers in navigating their caregiving responsibilities in the COVID context. So um, you could look at uh, our website for those resources as well. Um, with that, I wanna really sincerely thank our three leaders um, on this panel, Carlos, Catherine, and Susan for offering your incredible intelligence and insight into what is happening for caregivers in North America. Um, I know I learned a tremendous amount. I'm sure everybody tuning in did as well. I just wanna thank you for your advocacy and your leadership and hand it back over to Grace, our fearless leader. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Ijen. And, and if the speakers, if you want to hang on for even uh, a couple more minutes, um, we did have a couple of questions um, from the audience. Um, so let's see, Catherine and Susan, <laughs> don't go just yet. So this is a really interesting question, I think, from a global perspective. And Carlos, I'd like to start with you. Um, and the question is, Melinda Gates um, in the United States, but who works on global health initiatives, has called for a caregiving czar to be named by the incoming um, presidential administration. And my question would be, do you, do you think um, having sort of a, a, in your country, a leader on caregiving would accelerate and address some of the issues that you raised? Well, definitely once, once the, uh, there is a designation of, uh, of a person, uh, it means that there is uh, behind that designation, a policy to do something. So definitely it would be, it would be of great assistance if we could have something like that on, on place because the conversation here in Mexico has to start from zero, from zero. And once you start from zero, it is very easily to construct with all the experiences that are there in the world. We just heard from India, from Nepal, from Canada, from the United States, and there are a lot of experiences. So it was very easy, it would be very easy to try to implement a beginning of a caregiver's policy for our country. And Catherine, in Canada, is there a minister of, I know there's a minister of health, right? Is there a minister of caring? Uh, we have recently only one of the province, which is in Quebec, that have designated a minister of caregiving. Um, otherwise, usually our caregiving portfolio falls under community care, it falls under within our like dementia strategy, palliative care strategies, but not exactly one just focusing on caregiver. Interesting. And Susan, what are your thoughts on a caregiving czar? So I, I oh, am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. yes. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I love the idea. I'd like them to put money behind that, right? <laughs> it was nice her to say it, but they're a big foundation. Uh, and, you know, unless you're at the cabinet level, somehow I'd like to see that what power goes with that. It, it's only a figurehead. Um, I think when we saw in the UK, this, the Minister for Social Isolation or Social Connectedness, I haven't followed what else has happened, but we need some power and funding behind that. Absolutely. So one question I just want to leave y'all with that um, another audience member asked, um, she pointed out that uh, during the time of COVID, this is a chance for a lot of us to have conversations with our family about care preparedness. And what is it that you think would be most important to talk to families about other than just end of life directives? So Susan, if we want to start with you and then we'll go to Carlos and then Catherine. I think we need to talk about where you're going to live. Um, so, so many people, this is actually happening to someone I know, they want to live in their own place, far from everybody else, um, and yet they really can't manage. So it puts a tremendous strain on the family. And I'm not, I'm not saying what the decision should be, but they need to have a really solid communication plan. And this, this couple, I think, has some resources. So then they Maybe they can hire somebody or do something else, but it's it's all falling on the shoulders of the first daughter, as you can imagine, and she she just doesn't know where to go. So conversations about where to live. And Carlos, what do you think? Well, it's part of it. One of the biggest uh, recommendations for not getting COVID is uh, social distancing, stay home and all that. But uh, how do you implement uh, social distances or staying home with people who need you to be at home. And, 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 and this is something that is going to be needed uh, very soon. We have to educate people that before they go into the carers, uh, uh, the, the carer goes into the house of the patient, they need to be extremely careful of not being, of not having COVID because this will definitely provoke a chain reaction of, well, more deaths than the, the, the ones that we are having. So definitely it's education, education for, for the carer 
before it, had, it really has accepted responsibility of taking care of the people who are isolated in their houses. Catherine. Yeah, I guess building on what Susan and Carlos were saying is communication and educations around what they have to do or what they are expect, what potential expectations that uh, will be placed upon them and also making sure and identifying who is in their network and sharing what are, you know, what's their role and what other people can potentially do or other family members to support them in case of emergency. Wonderful. Well, I just want to second Ijin's thanks um, for participating and for sticking on another five minutes to answer questions, um, giving you a big round of applause and sending warm thoughts your way. And thank you so much um, for joining us. And, and please feel free to stay uh, as long as you like. Um, so thank you very much. So those of you who are listening in, um, you'll notice uh, there's a Q&A box as well as a chat box. And please continue to share your thoughts, your ideas, uh, your suggestions and resources. We're actually going to move into a portion um, where we're going to hear from a family caregiver in the United States. And I am very excited to introduce um, Debbie Harris, who is a member of the National Alliance for Caregiving Advocacy Collaborative. And she's gonna talk about her experience. And the reason we think this is important is because everything that we do, you know, we do on behalf of people who are caring for someone. And it's important that that voice is captured in any national or global conversation. So Debbie's gonna tell you a little bit about herself and then um, after Debbie talks, we're going to take a 10 minute break so that you can stretch, grab a cup of coffee, and then we'll come back for caregiving in Latin America. So Debbie, thank you so much for being here and please take it away. Certainly. Thank you so much, Grace, for having me. I am very honored to be able to speak with you all today uh, to share our family story. Um, many years ago when we started this journey, it seemed like a very lonely one. Um, Sometimes I question why we were in this journey. Um, in the past several years, since we started to share it, I found out that we were indeed not alone, that there are so many people who are taking this journey along with us because it is so isolating and, and, and we are often marginalized. Um, we don't know that sometimes until a, a long way into the journey. And so it's an honor for me to be able to share our story because indeed um, we have experienced a lot while we've um, cared for our son, Joshua. Um, and I think if we can show that we've survived <laughs> so far um, and that we've been able to do that by just taking life, maybe sometimes just 20 minutes at a time, um, and we've still kept the ability to hope. Um, if we can just give that little bit to someone else, um, then it's all been worthwhile. So um, if you could perhaps share the slide um, so I can see um, maybe where, where I am with the slide. Um, the first slide perhaps. Um, it should be displayed. Is it? Uh, is it? Okay. It might, are you on your phone? Uh, no, I'm on my pad, oh. but um, okay. but that's okay. Um, I will um, actually I'll pull it up on something else here. So okay. we're um, on the first slide now. Okay, thank you. So I'll just I'm going to talk about the beginnings of our journey, just so that you know um, the intensity of it so that um, you can compare that with why we are like we are right now. So um, our son Joshua is 27 years old and um, he was born um, just two months early. And that, you know, by today's standards is not that early, especially with the medical technology that they have now, um, it's not considered that premature. But um, I know that many of you have heard, because um, it's, it's all over the news now, about some of the inequities um, that are involved uh, with African-American women 
um, during pregnancy and uh, labor and uh, childbirth um, and some of the um, biases, implicit biases um, involved in our experience in having our children. And I know it's the subject of probably another entire conference, but that is what happened with, um, with Josh's birth. Um, he was actually um, just fine. Um, and uh, because he became tangled in his cord um, and did uh, change his in utero behavior, um, he could have probably been um, spared some of what he went through, but our physician's uh, clinic um, actually decided to not intervene. And they, um, even though I was in the hospital experiencing bleeding and loss of fluid, um, amniotic fluid, and Josh was in distress, they determined that um, they, it was a weekend, so it was a Saturday. They determined that they would rather wait until the weekend was over, they said, and more departments in the hospital were open. So the physician on call who had set up everything for Josh to be delivered um, and uh, had someone rush in from the mail to deliver him, um, everything was put on hold. And um, so Josh's uh, birth was um, delayed. And the next day um, in utero, he had a grade four intraventricular and central brain hemorrhage. And that is what caused his disabilities. So no sense in dwelling on the past, but that's what happened. And um, so when, so Josh was in the hospital about 127 days in the in ICU. And it was something, of course, we hadn't anticipated, you know, or expected. Um, when it was time for us to take Joshua home, um, we were told because of his disabilities and because they were supposed to be profound, they don't typically um, give a prognosis on, on disability at that point, but um, they were supposed to be profound. Um, we were told to take Josh home and to explain that he would only live to be two months old. And then um, they changed that and said, never mind, he will only live to be two weeks old. And so then we were told, um, and when you get home, uh, make sure you call the coroner because uh, when he dies, um, so they won't think that you killed him. So as you can imagine, um, we had a rather difficult start to this life with our son. Um, he's our third, he's our youngest. Um, we had formed some relationships with some amazing physicians before that. Um, our, our oldest son had um, meningeal, I, I, I hope I'm saying it right, encephalitis when he was about three months old. And um, he also had scarlet fever and he had some type of an immune um, reaction where his arms blew up and lesions formed and fluid started pouring out. I don't know what that was, but we met a doctor at that time when he was uh, small um, who became an advocate for our family and just seemed to appear out of nowhere like Clark Kent turning into Superman. <laughs> and he came to our rescue always at the right moment. And our, our middle son, um, he actually ended up in the um, NICU at five days old. It turned out that he he stopped breathing. He had um, projectile vomiting and, um, and, GER and GERD. And so um, he was in the NICU and we had to learn how to do um, infant CPR and um, uh, learn how to care for him specially. Um, he, we had to take him home, you know, do nebulizer treatments and so forth. He had to have a special seat and a special bed and so forth. Um, and then he, of course, got RSV because he was exposed and whatever. So we had our troubles along the line, uh, along the years, but we actually formed relationships then that we actually were going to need later on. And so um, when Joshua was born, there were people who had, um, I guess, biases, not only about us, 
as an African-American family and what resources, intellectual resources, moral resources, financial resources, whatever it was, whatever their biases were, um, that we weren't able to take care of a child like Joshua. However, Joshua being our third son, we could feel that he was fighting for his life. Uh, we could see in his eyes that he was feisty um, and aware and alert, even though he was so sick. Um, he was off the ventilator after three days, which showed how strong he was. Um, and so it wasn't really anything heroic that we were doing except, you know, supporting him in how he was basically living on his own, on, you know, of, of his own strength. Um, at one point he did uh, develop an upper respiratory infection and because he, he does have cerebral palsy with mixed tone um, in his torso, he has uh, very uh, weak tone and extremities, he has very high tone. So what would happen is his, um, when he got inflammation in his airway and they would lie him down right on his back, then his airway would uh, occlude and then he would have to be bagged apparently at that time. And so what happened at that point is that they, um, they, they, they put it, took us into a conference room and told us that um, they couldn't be bothered bagging him um, on, their, on the shifts that they were on um, for the whole weekend. Um, my husband, who is a career Marine, <laughs> had had enough at that point and said, just make sure that when the weekend's over, Josh is still here. <laughs> so he doesn't talk a lot, but when he does, everybody listens. <laughs> so um, for some reason, they did. They thought giving Josh a trach tube would be a heroic measure, and so they would not suggest it. Um, but we did know enough, you know, at that point that a trach tube was not that uh, huge of a surgery. Um, we did have another physician who advocated to do that. We had a resident who was from France um, who actually said to us, and it wasn't the most medical thing to say. He simply said, please, please fight to get him a trach tube because it's simply a stupid way to die. <laughs> and so we advocated to get Josh a trach tube to secure his airway. And we were able to take him home safely at that point. So as you can see, we've done a lot to support Josh. And when we got him home, we had a five-year-old, we had a three-year-old, and we had an infant who had uh, special health care needs. Um, Joshua, um, um, having the, the boys all very young in age, um, we wanted to make sure we normalized life for them. Um, I have an aunt who actually is a PhD and, and has written books on special education and so forth. And I've always admired her very much, but she did tell me at the time that if I brought Joshua home, I would ruin the other boys. And it devastated me and I, I believed her. And so we set out at the time as caregivers, like our philosophy was to make sure we did not ruin the other boys. And so we set up, we set, um, we set ourselves up to make sure that all of our kids had as normal life as possible. And I can tell you now, 27 years later, that it does take a toll on the caregivers to make sure that everybody gets to um, all of their extracurricular activities that, especially if you have a kid in hockey, <laughs> um, that's a brutal. So we did, we had a kid in hockey, we had a kid in, in, uh, in Cub Scouts, um, karate, um, all of it. And so doing all of that with a child who had over 40 surgeries, I lost count of the hospitalizations, uh, Josh having complex medical needs and, you know, a lot of respiratory infections, countless hospitalizations. And I stayed at the hospital for every one of them um, the whole time until, you know, from the, from when he was, um, uh, made impatient till he left, which was sometimes a week, sometimes it was a month, sometimes it was three months. Um, so it was a lot for our family. And so, um, as you can imagine, um, we are blessed and we are grateful to be at this moment in time because it wasn't expected. And so, um, 
the other, not the other day, but a couple months ago, as, as we embarked upon this journey with COVID looming over our heads, um, our middle son, who still lives at home with us, came to me and said, mom, and, and he's kind of an introvert and he like, he's kind of a homebody. He helps us a lot with Josh. He feels like his, you know, his dad and myself that we're just so old <laughs> that he needs to keep an eye on us. And he's, you know, he wants to make sure his brother's gonna be okay, which is a wonderful relationship that the boys have um, developed with their brother. I do want them to have a chance at a normal life. His older brother is married and has two small children, but um, I want to make sure that he has a normal life, but he, he is just so determined to make certain that his brother stays at home and is safe and is comfortable. And so that seems to be his priority. But he came to me and he said, Mom, I just want you to do something about COVID because even though I like to stay home, he said, I just can't stand this anymore. And with all the odds that we seem to have beat so far, um, I just said, I'm so sorry, boys. I have tried to do everything that I could for you, but, um, and we have beat a lot of odds, but I said, I just didn't plan on a global pandemic. And so <laughs> who does, you know? And I, I really hadn't imagined that we'd have to go through this. I know that a lot of families in our situation who have um, children and young people with complex medical needs, um, we already have the infection control thing down pat. Um, I'm part of a group of moms. All of our boys are about the same age. They have kind of varying needs. Um, a couple of us have boys who are, are pretty fragile. You see Josh there, and I, I'm sorry, I'm not looking at the pictures, but, it, and, I, and I'm sorry if you haven't changed the slide yet, please change the slide to the next one. But I tried to stuff as many pictures on the three slides as I could. But um, Joshua, he was pretty fragile um, in the beginning. And so those first years, he had tons of shunt infections and um, brain surgeries and respiratory infections as his, as his lungs were trying to get strong. And uh, because of the state of nursing at the time where agencies uh, were sending nurses to our home without training, uh, without orientation, they would just tell nurses that you know, he's not going to live long. He's just a trach and a G-tube. That's how they described him. So they didn't invest any time into um, sending anyone to do shifts to orient the nurses. Um, and so on about four occasions, um, Joshua was actually harmed by the nurses who came to our home and, um, and had to be hospitalized. The final occasion was when a nurse actually... Um, poured about 16 ounces of formula into his tube. And he has a very small tummy and um, he uh, aspirated that all, it, it broke through the sphincter and aspirated it into his lungs. And he was on an oscillator um, and 100% O2 for far too long. And the scarring that it caused in his lungs, um, if the initial incident didn't kill him, the scarring was, was going to, they thought. Somehow he made it through that and, um, and he survived it. Um, so um, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but um, so in any case, um, Joshua um, has survived a lot. Our family has survived a lot. Um, and I finally um, just devoted myself. I worked for a couple of years so I could, because I carried the insurance. Um, a lot of this time, my husband being a career Marine, um, he actually got um, activated for duty um, and was gone for um, cumulatively about three years during a Kuwait and Iraq war. Um, they took away our nursing care <laughs> during part of that time because they said they didn't pay for kids who can't be fixed. Um, for the first deployment of my husband, by the second one, I couldn't survive that. So we did get nursing the second time. Um, but we, so we survived a lot. But when COVID came, a, a lot of families like mine were already astute at, at doing infection control. And so that's not always the worry. Um, 
because we know how to do that. The worry is bringing people into your home and with every exposure they have in the outside world that you cannot control, that's an exposure to Joshua. And so I found myself creeping on social media, trying to see what the nurses were doing. My kids were telling me, mom, that's really weird. Don't do that. It's invasive. But I felt such a lack of control. And I wanted um, you know, to get a commitment from our nurses, but not knowing how much we could ask for them to sacrifice, um, it, it was really hard. Um, and so we had one nurse who wanted to do things like um, go to a bachelor party in Michigan, and we're in Minnesota when, when, when COVID was a, a lot more um, uh, severe there than it was in Minnesota and they were not gonna social distance, they were not gonna mask, they weren't gonna do anything but party and then come back and he didn't wanna use up his, you know, his PTO time, you know, to quarantine. And so it was a real conflict for us. And a lot of families at the time were um, excusing their home care nursing and not having anyone, but we've been doing this for 27 years. And so we're not one of those brand new families where you know, you've, you've only, your, your kid is four or five years old. And so you feel like you can just do this on your own, but 20 years down the line, believe me, you will find out that with the child or, or young person with 24 hour awake care, you, you can't always do that on your own. And I found that out, you know, when my husband was deployed, you know, for a year and a half at a time, and I had to do the care by myself, having only about two nights of nursing a week. And so uh, Josh's needs now, you know, now he's on a ventilator. Um, now our uh, supplies and equipment are being rationed more. Um, we're, we're, we're down to three boxes of gloves uh, per month for all of our staff from our vendor. Um, we're asked to not clean our vent equipment, the tubing and uh, connectors and so forth as much as usual because they need those supplies you know, out in the field. Um, we are having talks with our nursing staff that some of which we've had to furlough at times because we um, are too anxious to have them in our home. Um, PCA staff, which is only made up of our family, we've had to just ask to leave our home. Um, we're in the Twin Cities. So when the George Floyd murder happened here, um, we had to have my brother back in our home because um, his street was on fire. <laughs> And even though we'd furloughed him because it wasn't safe to have him here, we had to have him back here because it wasn't safe for him to stay home. Uh, there's just so many things that you cannot control when you're a caregiver. Um, and it's scary. And I'm not sure what the answer is, but um, I guess it is don't give up hope and keep being innovative and creative. And um, you know what? We got through the rest of this. We got here for 27 years, and I guess we'll get through COVID the same way we got through the, the last several years. So thank you. Debbie, I, I just want to thank you so much for sharing. Would it be okay if I just shared a couple of questions that we have sure. from the audience? Yeah. So one was, um, was there has there been any particular initiative or program that helped you feel more connected with others or more prepared uh, or to avoid isolation? Yes, um, I have my group of friends I had mentioned, um, we used to go out about maybe once a quarter because it was so difficult for us to actually physically get out. This is before COVID, but for us to meet up for an evening was like our kind of getaway and, and what kind of kept us going. Now we can't do that, but on Monday nights we meet uh, via Zoom. <laughs> And we call ourselves the um, ex we call ourselves the ordinary moms of extraordinary boys, and we are like the four women in the world who completely get everything that we're talking about. <laughs> and so we really need that call, that Zoom call. We really need to see each other. We just um, it's it's like medicine to us, and so it's our cure for COVID. And that's what we do. 
<laughs> Debbie, I love that. <laughs> Ordinary mom, <laughs> extraordinary kids. That is great. Well, I would just um, just extend a warm thank you so much for for sharing your experiences and the beautiful photos of your family. Um, if, if you'd like to stay, we'd love you to stay mm -hmm. as part of the conversation. And you'll see that there's a, a number of comments um, about your family and, and sending you warm thoughts uh, here in the chat. So take a look at that. And thank okay. you again so much. Okay. We appreciate thank, it. Thank you so much for inviting me. Of course. So we're going to take a five minute break. We'll come back at five after the hour. So we encourage you to get up, stretch your legs, um, but make sure to come back quickly because we're very excited about um, the, the panel we're ending on today, which is on caregiving in, um, in South America and Central America. And I think you'll be excited to learn um, you know, what's happening in that part of the world. So thank you so much. Take a five minute break and we'll see you back here at five after the top of the hour. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're very excited um, to be moving into our, our last panel of the day, um, which Jan, if you're joining us now, this is the World Carers Conversation. We're, we're hosting a virtual summit on the state of caregiving in the era of COVID-19. And my name is Grace Whiting. I'm the president and CEO of the National Alliance for Caregiving, which is in the Washington DC area in the United States of America. So we're gonna move into a discussion on caregiving in South America. And I encourage you to continue the conversation. If you're on Twitter or Facebook, you can use the hashtag world carers. If you are participating with us live on Zoom, we encourage you to ask um, questions through the Q and A box or in the chat and to introduce yourselves. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask that our panelists take themselves off of mute. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about who we have speaking, but if you would go ahead to, you know, take yourself off of mute um, and turn your cameras on, and that way we can get started with the conversation. So I'm very uh, thrilled to share that um, one of my favorite people and one of our staff members at the National Alliance for Caregiving, Gabriela Prudencio, will be moderating moderating today's panel. And Gabriella is the Hunt Research Director at the National Alliance for Caregiving, where she manages a comprehensive research strategy to support policies and initiatives for unpaid family caregivers across aging, healthcare, disability, and long-term care sectors. Gabriella, I should mention, is our first um, National Research Director, and she's filling big shoes from the founder of our nonprofit organization who started our organization as a research institute back in 1996. Gabriella also has extensive experience um, in various other research initiatives, including uh, the global level. She has worked uh, domestically with the AARP Foundation and the Economic Policy Institute, particularly on programs that informed policies related to income, food, housing and job security for older Americans and the American working class. She's also studied the dietary habits of multi-generational households and globally has led numerous studies on agricultural subsectors in Latin America, Southeast Asia, the Middle East and Southern and Eastern Africa. She's also worked at Mercy Corps where she mapped the nutmeg subsector of the Maluku Islands of Indonesia and leverage those findings to design a program that would improve business relationships between farmers and exporters. In addition to the work that she does at NAC, Gabriella is a graduate uh, with a master's in business administration from Georgetown University, and she has a master's in international commerce and policy from George Mason and lives in Maryland with her family. And she loves food, traveling and spending time in nature. So very excited to have Gabriella kicking off uh, today's conversation. I also wanna introduce you to uh, some of our uh, faces who you maybe have not encountered in some of these global care conversations before, but, but we are very excited to have with us. So um, Mercedes Carrillo is the legal officer of the Department of Social Inclusion at the Organization of American States and secretary for that same organization's administrative tribunal. She has a PhD in international law and in 
International Relations from the Complutense University of Madrid. And she's authored numerous publications in procedural law, border conflicts, and social inclusion. She served as a consultant for the Inter-American Commission of Women in 2008 and as secretary for the Inter-American Committee on Persons with Disabilities from 2010 to the present. So very excited to have her with us today. In addition, I want to introduce you to Dr. Yanira Cruz, who is um, a, a fabulous colleague of ours who's been working in Washington um, as the head of the National Hispanic Council on Aging. And Dr. Cruz has focused on providing a Latino perspective on public health older adult and caregiver issues in order to increase policymaker and public understanding of the needs that impact the vulnerable sectors of our society and to encourage the adoption of programs and policies that can equitably serve everyone. Dr. Cruz is on the National Senior Citizens Law Center. She's a member of the American Society on Aging for more than 10 years and is a member of leaders of aging organizations. She's also one of the founders of the Diverse Elders Coalition, and she was recently named a top 50 influencer in aging by Next Avenue. She's been an appointee for the Advisory Council on Alzheimer's Research Care and Services, which advises the US Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. And she received her Bachelor of Science in Biology, a Master's in Public Health, and her Doctorate in Public Health with a specialty in Global Health from the George Washington University School of Public Health and Human Services. So very excited um, to have her with us. And our last speaker, um, give me just one second. So, um, Alicia uh, Newman is joining us today, and I'm not sure if, you, <laughs> if I'm seeing your bio on our website, but we would love for you, um, maybe as we kick off, to share a little bit about your background and how you came to this topic, and then if you want to hand it to Gabriella, and Gabriella will kick off uh, the discussion, that would be great. <laughs> okay, no problem, Grace. <laughs> So I, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm here representing Instituto Oncoguia, uh, which is a cancer patient support organization in Brazil. A little bit about my background. I have, well, I am from Brazil. I am currently living in Pittsburgh, United States, where I came to do my PhD in public health at the University of Pittsburgh. And I also did, along with the doctoral studies, I did a certificate in Latin America, social and public policy, and a certificate in evaluation of public health programs. I have about 20 years of experience working with social and health programs, and it, which goes from community development to you know, public policies and a lot of work in planning and evaluation. So, and then, well, why I'm here, it's because caregiving is one of my great interests and I have done some work with, I have, I have done and I'm doing currently now some work with Instituto Oncoguia in this area. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you, Dr. Newman. Um, we, are, um, we are super thrilled that each of you uh, have accepted to, to be in this important event to talk about an issue that's extremely important for um, the Americas, both Latin America, and I'm so happy that uh, each of you can, can represent these views, but also um, the United States, which has a huge Hispanic population who is vulnerable. So I'm just humbled also to have Dr. Uh, Yanira Cruz here to compliment. So without further ado, I am going to pass the baton to the first speaker, Mercedes Carrillo from the Organization of American States. Welcome, Mercedes, and over to you. Well, thank you, Gabriela. Good afternoon to all the distinguished audience that join us today. I would like to begin by thanking on behalf of the Department of, uh, Department of Social Inclusion of the Organization of American States for the opportunity to be part of this important conversation on the state of caregiving in the era of COVID-19. Uh, just to give you a little context, the Organization of American States is the oldest regional organization in the world that brings together all the independent countries of the Americas to work through international cooperation and political dialogue to strengthen 
democracy, human rights, security, and development in our continent. The OAS is the main political, juridical, and social governmental forum in the hemisphere. If you could please uh, go to the next slide, thank you. Okay. The OAS recognized or its position is that certainly the pandemic for COVID-19 has affected all of us directly or indirectly. However, there are persons in situation of vulnerability with limit or sometimes no access to medical care, good services, and the impact for their people is much broader, limiting their access to service basics or to their rights for social, economically and, and social rights, uh, because these people used to tend or used to be a victim of multiple discrimination. If you could go to the next slide, please. We are referring particularly to persons in poverty situation, most of them also pertaining to other vulnerable groups, for example, a persons with disability, women, um, a persons of African descent, indigenous populations, LGBTQI persons, displaced persons, migrants, refugee asylum seekers, persons deprived of liberty, persons liberty in poverty or extreme poverty, children, etc. So the OAS through its Department of Social Inclusion has understood that these persons require a special consideration for when the member states try to design and implement public policies responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it is in this context that we have launched uh, in, the, in the first half of this year's a practical guide on inclusive response with a human right-based approach for COVID-19 responses. Uh, this guide is divided in 10 uh, categories or 10 subjects, each one for every particular group in situation of vulnerability. And I will be pleased to share with you some of the recommendations that we have shared to the member states in this do important document. Um, but uh, I, because of uh, time limitations, I'm going to focus in only two particular groups. These are persons with disability and older persons because they are the groups that mostly require uh, caregiving or personal assistance services. But I would love to invite you to our website and go to the tab of social inclusion or access to rights in order to download the complete guide in which you will see all the di uh, regional diagnostic of every group in situation of vulnerability, as well as the specific recommendation by uh, all of these particular groups. So um, I would like to begin, for example, with the recommendations that we have been given related to older persons. Uh, the first of all, the first of it will be uh, generate and create protocols for preventions and control mechanisms in social and health services to prevent negligent actions that impair protection of older persons' right to health and dignity. Also, it has been recommended to generate, generate a statistical information, taking older persons into account with a view to recording how they have been affected by COVID-19 and the interventions procedures that were carried out. Also, we have recommended to the member states of the Americas to provide accurate and adequate information to older persons according to their circumstances for decision making and evaluation of health and social risk situations. This means taking whatever steps are needed to include deaf persons, hard of hearing person, and people with cognitive disability or mental health conditions. Uh, the member states are also encouraged to generate processes to control and monitoring the prices of essential products for the, for the elderly, since during a health emergency, of course, these costs tend to be or, or tend to increase or being higher. Uh, also, the member states or, or the countries of the America has to promote special measures to protect against violence, abuse, and mistreatment of other persons, paying particular attention to the fact that these stay-at-home recommendations may lead to isolation and exacerbate domestic violence against them. Another measure is that all older persons under full institutional care require a special protection. In that sense, surveillance and coordination are needed to safeguard 
the right of other persons, including the right to health and dignity. A key recommendation is also not to stop services for the protection of the right of older persons, such as legal aid, payment of pensions and retirement benefits or access to social benefits. And this is our, these are some of the recommendations issued by the older persons group. With respect to persons with disability, we have developed uh, older recommendations in four different categories. Those are information and communication policies, contagious control and mitigation policies, healthcare and attention policies during the emergency, and planning and preparedness policies for future emergencies. So regarding the information and communication policies, some of the recommendations that have been issued are that all public health information before, during, and after the emergency must be disseminated in accessible formats to persons with disability at the same time and through the same channels as for the rest of the population. That implies that all audible communication must be available in visual materials like sign languages or subtitles, and all visual information must be available as well in audio formats, such as audio descriptions, audio text, tactile method, augmented communication, and other alternative of communication formats. This must be plain, there must be plain language uh, like pictograms or infographic for persons with intellectual disabilities. Also sign language interpretation must be carried out by trained professionals recognized by the national deaf community who are together with the authorities reporting the situation, including the television. Make information and communication technologies and assistive technologies that promote autonomy of individuals in emergency available to persons with disability. For example, video chats for the use of interpreters in health services, emergency hotlines, phone numbers to get basic supplies delivered, program to describe environment to blind people, read labels, etc. Sign language interpreters and personal assistants guide interpreter for persons who are blind or with low vision, among others, working in healthcare and emergency situation must receive the same health, hygiene, and safety protection as other personnel working on COVID-19. And on the other hand, recommendations about contagious control and mitigation policies include, for example, protective measures for persons with disabilities in a specific circumstance, for example, disinfecting entrance doors reserved for wheelchair users, ramp and stair handrails, and not a doorknob for persons with reduced mobility. Also, prioritization of persons with disabilities and not older persons in the delivery of protective gloves, antibacterial soap, and antibacterial wipes, among others, as they require them more frequently since they use their hands to move around and interact with the environment. Also, we have to consider home tests for the virus, prioritizing persons with disabilities, their personal and family assistance, and other persons. Establishing communications and coordination policies with communication support networks and intermediary care services for persons with disabilities and other adults in emergency situations to ensure community advice and support in the context of public responses to the emergency. Authorized by law, remote psychiatric and psychological support among other professional services, which could be also covered by social protection policies since COVID-19 crisis, as we all know, and confinement measures can generate stress and anxiety and fear. Also, um, and it is very important, under no circumstance should institutionalization and abandonment due to disability being authorized. Persons with disability should not be institutionalized as a consequence of quarantine measures or any other reason, and especially without their free and informed consent. Personal assistance, support workers, caregivers, interpreters who continue to provide their services during the quarantine should be proactively tested for COVID-19 to minimize the risk of spreading the virus for persons with disabilities. Uh, with respect to the recommendations that we have issues on policies on healthcare and during, the, during and after the emergency, 
uh, we have said that it is necessary to train all local and national health service personnel in effective, accessible, and affordable care and communication regarding persons with disabilities with a focus on human rights and equity. Persons with disabilities who need health services due to COVID-19, such as hospitalizations, ventilators, etc., cannot be deferred or omitted due to their disability. From a public policy perspective, it is essential to clearly prioritize human life and human dignity first and foremost equally and without any distinction of any kind due to disability or age. And lastly, with respect to policies on planning and preparedness for future emergency, it is essential to generate statistical broken down by groups in situation of vulnerability, including persons with disabilities in order to collect evidence need to plan in response for the future health and other emergency. There is um, good practice in this, regard, in this regard, like the use, for example, of virtual service through platforms such as uh, SurveyMonkey or others to facilitate the production of unpublished and approximate data in the context of crisis. And finally, before, during, and after emergencies, states must engage in close consultation and in collaboration with civil society organization of the region representing persons with disabilities and their families who most actively participate in the entire process of proposal design, approval, and monitoring of the public policies responses on solutions to the crisis. These are well some of the recommendations recently published by the Organization of American States in this practical guide uh, be, uh, for COVID-19 responses. We truly hope that they can provide important information to your different areas of work. And I want to encourage all of you to disseminate it so we can uh, better assist to the member states in this task uh, of providing human rights approach responses. I remain at your disposal for any further information and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Cruz. Uh, Dr. Carrillo, for the work that you have done uh, with the Organization of American States to support Latin American families and communities in this critical time. I'm going to now hand it over to Dr. Yanira Cruz, uh, who is the President and CEO of the National Hispanic Council on Aging. Welcome, Dr. Cruz. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gabriela, for holding the session and uh, thank you uh, to Grace as well for her wonderful leadership in, in the field of older adults, in the field of aging. It's a, it's a true pleasure to serve with Grace in different um, committees and different uh, spaces um, in the United States. So thank you, Grace, for your leadership and your, your wisdom to put us in a better place as a society. Um, so let me just start sharing a little bit about um, the National Hispanic Council on Aging. So the NACOA, as the term we normally use, has been around for 50 years. Um, and our mission is to improve the lives of Hispanic older adults and their caregivers. So, um, so we serve primarily the Latinx population uh, living in the United States. Uh, which includes individuals who are documented, but also those individuals who are undocumented. We, we work with individuals who've been here for centuries and whose families have been here for centuries and, and uh, where they experience the border moving on them, for example. For example, in many communities in New Mexico where the border moved on them, they never moved and now they're in American soil. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to, to serve a very diverse um, population. Um, our immigrant communities, as Grace indicated in, in her openings, um, represents a number of, of Hispanics who, who came from South America, from Central America, um, <clears throat> from Mexico, and of course, the Caribbean. So for example, at our house, uh, we have housing facilities where we provide housing for older adults who are able to live independently. 
And just to give you an example, in one of our housing facilities, which is based here in DC, uh, called Casa Iris, Casa Iris, um, we have 16 countries represented. Many of them are from South America, Bolivia, Colombia, uh, Brazil, and as well as the Caribbean. So it really is a, uh, a nice mixture of the various cultures that are represented um, when we talk about Latinos and the Latinx community, which is really not a monolithic population as we all know. So um, then uh, let me just uh, focus a little bit on the current situation. Um, what has happened lately with the Latinx community in the United States. So over the last four years or so, um, uh, immigrants and the Latinx population in the United States have been under tremendous pressure, tremendous pressure with anti-immigrant rhetoric and harsh policies. And so, um, so for example, just to give you an example of some of the policies that have been um, front and center for, for, for those of us who are Latinos living in the United States, public charge, some of you will remember during the summer, the administration put out language that anyone who uh, used services that were um, funded by the government, whether it's healthcare, housing, uh, nutrition, that, that there would be consequences, negative consequences, if later on down the road, you wanted to resolve your immigration status, if you wanted to become a US citizen, or if you were, want, you were in, in the process of uh, resolving your immigration status here to become a, a permanent resident, that that would have negative consequences. So that was one thing that happened. The other thing that happened <clears throat> during the summer is that, um, you will recall that during the Affordable Care Act, the law that was brought into place uh, that expanded healthcare coverage and that improved access to healthcare for many, many, many individuals across the country during President Obama. Um, so that, that act, the Affordable Care Act, uh, included language that protected individuals who did not speak English when accessing health services. And we were all very happy to see that because we do, we do know that when it comes to matters of healthcare, um, sometimes we just wanna speak in the language that is our native tongue. Sometimes when, it, when, it's, when it's, uh, it's an issue that is so personal and so close to us, we wanna be able to ensure that we understand, right? So that, that protection was removed during the summer. Um, and so folks who went to hospitals and clinics um, no longer should expect uh, to have you know, translation services unless it, were, it was at the goodness of their heart to do it. Whereas before it was mandated by law. Um, in addition to that, later on in the summer, well, many women who were detained in the border um, or underwent gynecological procedures without their consent. This happened about six months ago. We saw the reports. In addition to that, we saw that many children were detained and kept in cages in the US-Mexico border. And that is not news to most of us. We know that's been taking place. So why do I say this? I, I say this because this has consequences when it comes to a pandemic in a public health response. Um, the reality uh, created this, this, the consequences is that we, we created a sense of fear of the healthcare system for many Latin Xers. And, um, and, and, and also just, just getting access to any government related service or information was a source of fear for many of our community members across the country. Um, and so many Latinos who have been infected with the virus have refused to seek care from healthcare, from the healthcare system for fear of being deported or for fear of exposing a family member uh, to, to a, a risky situation 
uh, that might uh, have negative co immigration consequences. So, um, um, so, so what's happened is many Latinos have actually stayed at home to recover from the coronavirus. Many of them have not looked for, for, um, for testing uh, as a result of, of the negative consequences that might come from, from that. And, that's, and that is um, extremely concerning. It is extremely com concerning from a human side, you know, how terrible that we can't feel free to access the services that are needed in time of, um, of a pandemic. But also from a public health point of view, if we want to control and manage and, and uh, do proper surveillance of this, uh, of this pandemic, how can we do it if, if we don't have um, individuals who are, who are comfortable uh, putting themselves out there with, with, their, um, with their condition? So, um, you know, as, as, as a result of this situation, many nonprofits, primarily nonprofits that have a history of being in the community for many years and who are trusted for the community, had to change their focus to address the coronavirus pandemic. And um, many organizations have done this, many nonprofits um, have done this, and that, that has been great to see. The National Hispanic Council on Aging has been, has been one of those organizations that gladly stepped forward um, and shifted our gear, shifted our focus to ensure that we were, we were providing science-based information, but also information in, in, in a language that was understood by populations and in a way that it was culturally appropriate. Um, we also translated some of the materials in Portuguese, because we do know that we have a, a large Brazilian community in the United States. And so um, um, some, of our, some of our key messages are being translated into, into Portuguese. So we have Portuguese, Spanish, and, and English. Um, so um, so that, has, that has been good. Um, uh, th then as far as, um, as far as caregivers, as far as caregivers, they have also experienced tremendous stress during the pandemic. They are frontline workers. They are exposing themselves to risk each day. Each day they step out of their home, they are exposing themselves. Um, their, their pay conditions is very limited. We know that that's a, that's a, that's a big struggle that we have in our country. Um, we do know that they don't have leaves that pay that cover for time off if they get sick or if someone in their family gets sick, um, many of them do not have access to health insurance. Many of the very caregivers that are helping older adults that are going to the hospitals where care, to help them provide care, they themselves do not have healthcare services um, available to them. In fact, um, last week I had, I had the um, opportunity to interview one of the caregivers at Casa Iris. Um, and um, it was a very powerful interview. And one of the things, the, um, one of the things that um, this lady um, shared with me is that, um, is this very idea that uh, they don't have access to health services. And if they, if they get sick, they would, they would be out without, without any you know, safety net. Uh, to, to go out and seek services for themselves. So it, it really is a very vulnerable situation for, for caregivers in the United States. And I should also mention that um, many of the caregivers are dreamers. Um, dreamers are uh, individuals whose immigration status has been very fragile and in danger lately. Um, they are covered, they have a they, they are covered under a temporary protective status. These are individuals who came into the United States as kids by choice of their parents, not their own. And this is primarily the only country they know. And uh, oftentimes they don't even speak Spanish. Um, so there's, we have many dreamers who are also doing caregiving work. 
So immigration reform is important to address in the context, in the context of humanity, but also in the context of caregiving. Um, <clears throat> so in this context, um, you know, what have we done uh, to help and assist um, documented and undocumented, documented and undocumented immigrants in the United States during the pandemic? Well, I, I mentioned earlier, we've been putting out information, webinars, um, virtual events to, to get information out to our communities. But one thing that became very apparent, apparent during the epidemic is that many Latinos in the United States do not have access to the technology that many of us have access to. And that there's a huge digital divide that is, um, is right here as, as a huge barrier. And um, so we've had to, as an organization, we've had to figure out solutions to that. We know that Facebook, for example, is a more popular tool for many, many Hispanics that we want to get to. And so we've had to do cafecitos with NACOA, for example, where we have, uh, you know, uh, conversations, uh, brief conversations via Facebook to connect with, with individuals on topics related to COVID. Um, Thank you, Dr. Cruz. I am so, sorry to say that um, we need to stop um, the presentation to pass it over, Licia, due to Due to time constraints, no but problem. No problem. Thank you. We can we can we can take take it from here. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Cruz. Being a Latina myself and living in the United States, I can relate to a lot of what you said. It was very interesting listening to you. And I'm so glad for the work you do. So I want to take you to a different context now, which is the context of family caregivers of cancer patients. And um, so I just want to give you a very quick uh, overview of our organization. So next slide, please. Instituto Oncoguia was created in 2009 by Luciana Holtz, who is a psycho-oncologist. And I think she's in the audience today. And the organization was created due to the big impact that cancer has had in, in the country, in Brazil, just for you to have an idea. Only in 2020, we expect to have more than 625,000 new cases, which means about 70 cases every minute. And we know how much cancer impacts not only the cancer patient and the family and friends and, and all the context there is around this patient. So Oncogia develops and, and works in different areas to try to promote changes, um, deliver like quality information and even like individual guidance to individuals to for them to better understand the disease, better understand their journey throughout the, the disease and even like access rights and better treatment and diagnosis. So next slide. But I'm here to tell you about the work we have been doing with family caregivers. So I want to say that we have had family members contacting Instituto Oncoguia since the beginning, since, since the organization was created. And I just brought you a graph here showing you that with our uh, toll-free number, which we call Ligue Cancer, we always receive calls from family members. In the past nine years, we received calls from more than 4,000 family members. And they called us with very different like questions and concerns and many times to share their stories and the barriers that they are facing when supporting a cancer patient. And what we noticed, however, was that even though they come to us through like um, email, phone calls, they go to our events, very, very rarely they talk to us about themselves. They talk to, to us about the, face, the, the challenges that they are facing as a caregiver. And so as I came to the United States to do my, my doctoral studies at the University of Pittsburgh, I start doing research and start learning with the work that AARP do, does, NAC, so I'm very happy to be here today. I just got so interested on you know, learning more about the family caregiver perspective. So I start talking to Luciana about this and, you know, like what can we do and what can, how can we know more about the impact of cancer on family members? 
And so in 2018, I was awarded a grant to go to Brazil and do some research to try to have a better understanding of who are these caregivers, family caregivers of cancer patients. What are their needs? What are the sources of support? And what can we do for them? So I'm, I'm sure a lot of what I learned is not a surprise for you. But for me, it was very surprising to see how hard it was to get family caregivers to talk about their perspective and their issues and how cancer had affected them. Because in their minds, it was like, how can I say anything about me when I have a loved one who is facing cancer? You know, who's going through treatment and all the side effects and all the anxiety and fear. So during the focus groups and interviews, I many, many times had to say, yeah, I understand everything you were saying about the challenge that cancer patients are facing, but can we talk about you now? Can we look at you now and talk about what it has been for you to become a caregiver? And it was very, very enlightening. I, I learned a lot. And then, you know, when sharing with uh, Uncle Gia, next slide, please. We designed some initiatives specifically to better reach, outreach family caregivers and give them quality information and support the best way we could. So these are just some of the initiatives we now have for family caregivers. We have in our portal, a page that is specifically dedicated to them. And we also launched a project last year that is called Cuide Si Para Poder Cuidar, which roughly translate to take care of yourself, to be able to take care of the other. And I think Anil this morning started talking about the mask and the plane. And I was like, yes, <laughs> that's exactly it. We understand cancer can comes. No one expects that. No one ever expects to be a caregiver of a, of a cancer patient. Even those families that have history of cancer, they always have the hope that that's not gonna happen to them again. So, it's a surprise and a big change in their lives. But we think it's important for them to understand that they have a role in the context of care and, and to be to play this role and to be you know good partner, they also need to look at themselves. So as you can see, we develop a guide that we try to be very friendly and light and like with the, the, the layout and the language. And we start by, by opening this guide, telling a little bit about what it is to be a caregiver. And I heard all the discussion before about, you know, like the different terms we use. And I just want to say that I don't know if it's, it's specifically in Brazil, but a lot of what I heard there was like, I don't see myself as a caregiver. What I do is what any, any family member should do. Like it's my mom facing cancer. Of course, I'm gonna stop going out with my friends and will take care of her all the time. It's my husband who's facing cancer or of course I need to you know, stop working to take care of him. So it's kind of like, it's part of being a family member. And so with this guide and then also with other materials we created, we have been trying to say to these caregivers that they continue being a family member, but by becoming a caregiver, they assume different tasks, new tasks, new responsibilities that they need to manage with everything else they have in their lives. And it's okay to have some feelings that sometimes they don't feel so, um, you know, so it's not so easy for them to share, but it's important for them to, you know, seek support, do, you know, work on their self-care and all of this. So next slide. And then finally, I want to tell you a little bit of what we have been doing during COVID-19, because as it happened to everyone else, COVID-19 came, turned the lives of everyone upside down. And then soon enough, in March, we started receiving calls at Oncogia from pa cancer patients and family members very scared about what was happening and trying to better understand not only the the disease and the pandemic, but what would be the impact on them, on their treatment, on their lives. And so we thought, okay, on one hand, we need to address these needs. We need to try to give them the best information we have. And as you know, we were getting new information every day about the virus and what to do, what not to do. So we were always informing them. But we also thought it was important to do a national survey to try to see how the, the pandemic was affecting the lives of cancer patients all over the country. 
And so we did, we designed the survey, we implemented, it was an online survey. We, we launched in two phases. The first one was between March and May, the second one between July and September. And even though the survey was not for family caregivers, we had some family members answering the questionnaire. And so we had opportunity to look at how COVID-19 was impacting them. So this first graph here on the top, it shows how they answered when we asked, how are you feeling about this pandemic? So the, the orange bar is I'm anxious. Then the second one is I'm afraid. The third one is I'm sad. Then the fourth one, the purple one is I'm confused, which we're happy to see that decrease a little bit on the second phase. And the last one is I'm confident, which increased a little bit. So it was important for us to know and try to kind of like with our um, services, try to better support them based on how they were feeling. And then finally, I wanna tell you about another initiative that we call Roda de Conversa, which I think is a little bit similar to the cafezito that Dr. Cruz mentioned. It is an online uh, meeting that we, have, we hold every week and it's, it's open. So we say it's a kind of support group, but it's, it's open, anyone can join. And during these two hours, which are facilitated by professionals, both the facilitators and the participants can bring up themes that they wanna talk about. And it's focused on giving them a space to talk about COVID-19, to share their questions and to tell about how it's affecting their lives. And the good thing about this group is that the group itself tried to come up with solutions or ideas to help them deal with the challenges. So just giving you a very quick example, we have had some caregivers coming to these conversations. And one of the things they, they shared, one of the challenges they shared with us was their concern about not being able to go with their, the cancer patient to medical appointments. So they were very afraid of the, their loved one not being able to properly communicate everything to the physician and then not being able to bring back the information in a way that the family caregiver could then you know, work with, with the patient on whatever new orientation he had, they had. So one of the suggestions that the group came up with was why don't you do a checklist with the patient before they go to the appointment? And then with this checklist, you can make sure you cover everything. And then if you feel insecure, why don't you take, why don't you ask your, uh, you know, the cancer patient to take the, a cell phone with them and then they can text you or call you from the appointment. And so like there were just ideas, but I think we felt that those ideas and just having this, this opportunity to share and to be heard, you know, and to, to be supported also helped them to feel more confident about the things they could do during this pandemic that, you know, affect everyone's lives. So next slide. Uh, so thank you, obrigada. I know I'm the last one to speak today. So I want to thank you a lot for everyone who is still here with me. And I just want to say this is a little bit of what we have done for family caregivers uh, in, at Oncogia, but we are we want to do much more. Like we really want to be able to be a source of support and information and do like innovative things to be there, not only for the cancer patients, but, but for their family caregivers. So any ideas, any advice from all of you who have more experience on this than us, any ideas for partnerships, we would love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Newman. Um, thank you to all the panelists. I am uh, thrilled to, to have heard your reception, receptions. I want to hand it over to Grace Whitening, who is monitoring for Q&A from the audience. I know that we are uh, a little short on time, and I want to make sure that we, we can um, finish as we, as we said. So I um, so one thing I would just say is it's amazing all the collective research and insights that you offered. So I, I'm just my heart is so full and I'm so thankful. Um, so we had an interesting question and I think we have time for this question and then we'll move to Jasmine um, to close us out. But um, a, a colleague in Canada said that since COVID has happened and in healthcare settings, there's been this rebranding of caregivers from being visitors to being desig designated essential partners in care. Um, and I think part of that is that recognition in the healthcare system. And so the question is whether there's been a similar shift in other countries in South and Central America and 
whether caregivers are allowed to really be at the bedside in hospitals or long-term care during COVID. Um, so uh, Dr. Newman, would you like to, to go first and then we'll go to Mercedes and end with Yanira? So not as far as I know, I haven't heard. I think that's a fantastic idea. <laughs> I would love that. And I think maybe it's something we can try to bring to Brazil uh, because they are, you know, very important part and very important support. What we heard from all of them is that they were, you know, require, require, required not to come to appointments. And then not even the information was so clear. So then they were very anxious about what was going to happen with the cancer patient and they could not be there to support. So not as far as I know in Brazil. Mercedes, what, any thoughts from, from your perspective? Yeah, we don't have particular information in some of the countries of South America. However, from a general perspective, if we focus on persons with disabilities and the right to choose a personal caregiver, a, a personal support, um, we have to remember that there are international treaties that say they have the right to choose uh, the person that is going to give them all the personal assistance they need since they actually need a specialized services for communication, for receiving the information or for their independent living in general. So any practice that uh, restricts them to have the person selected by them to be in the hospital uh, or providing caregiver in any state for sure is violatory to the international treaties of human rights, especially the International Convention of Human Rights of the United Nations and the Inter-American Convention Against All Forms of Discrimination of Persons with Disabilities. So what we have to do if these situations are happening is uh, go and asking for help to the organization of civil society that represents persons with disabilities and their families, because they will know for sure how to uh, channel complaints against uh, violations or, for example, go through the National Secretariat on Disability of the member states, CONADIS or SENADIS is how they are known in South America, or the Ombudsperson. Uh, those are different uh, instances where people can go and, and make a claim or a complaint about this kind of situation that for sure is violatory of international treaties and national law. Because remember that when a treaty is ratified by the member state, it has it becomes national law. And if the treaty say that the person with disability has the right to designate a person of his preference, uh, his, his or her will for taking decisions, that has to be respected. Thank you so much. That's a, that's a wonderful place for us to look for sort of what the common values are. Yanira, do you wanna close us out? Just a quick note, and just to say that it's so important to 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 know those rights, um, and and to figure out ways to operationalize to to make it real, uh, and um, especially for individuals who don't speak English and individuals who don't understand the language. Um, so, and again, you know, healthcare is such a sensitive matter that it's important that we understand the concepts, that we understand what we're being told. So just wanna say so important and let's hope to figure out a way to make it happen, make those policies um, implemented. Wonderful. Well, I'm, I just wanna thank all of you and Gabriella, thank you so much for moderating this panel. We are so appreciative of all the great work you're doing. And, um, and, and looking forward to ongoing conversations. So um, as we wrap up for today, I'm going to um, initiate a poll and we encourage you um, to, to share with us your perspectives um, of today and, and what, you know, what you got out of today. If you're watching on Facebook, you can also leave a comment um, under Facebook. And then um, I'm gonna hand things to Jasmine Greenemeyer, who is um, our partner in this effort and who heads up the Embracing Carers Initiative at EMD Serrano, which outside of the US is known as Merck KJ Darmstadt, Germany. <laughs> so, um, but Jasmine is, is truly a, a, an expert in public policy and thought leadership and, um, and 
if you'll wrap us up for today. And then just, just a reminder to everyone that we've got two more exciting days. Tomorrow will be um, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. And we'll be starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. And then Thursday, I, I mean, Wednesday evening um, will be a focus on Asia and the South Pacific. So we will also share that information in the chat. But Jasmine, if you would, please close us out uh, for this wonderful day of discussion. Well, thank you, Grace, and the National Alliance for Caregiving, again, for hosting this. I think we're all just, um, just feeling honored, right, that we could intentionally set aside this time to have this global conversation. Well, as Grace alluded to, I'm Jasmine Greenemeyer with uh, EMV Sereno. We're a healthcare company just outside of uh, Boston, and we're the funder and the convener of Embracing Cares, which is a global movement to better understand how to support the unmet needs of caregivers. Um, and particularly, we look at the emotional, financial, and health impact of caregiving, particularly as it relates to unpaid caregiving. But I wanna just pause and thank Debbie Harris uh, for so generously sharing Josh and her family's story. Thus, and I feel like more of us um, who are in the caregiving um, space with our family and our neighbors or loved ones. Um, I want more of us to have a support group like she has with you know, the ordinary moms of extraordinary boys. But I also wanna thank the speakers today who gave us the breadth and depth of thinking about this from a local, a regional and global perspective. And I feel like um, Nadine and Anil set us right up from the very beginning talking about caregiver rights you know, particularly as it relates to COVID and beyond, because we're seeing increasingly there is very specialized needs for informal and unpaid caregivers. Um, and I think there was an emphasis around the diversity of the caregiver experience um, that I thought just is beginning to pull the thread on where we need to go and better moving from recognizing caregivers and their experience to action. Um, as Grace alluded to, you know, we continue this conversation tomorrow, uh, very early, just to be sensitive to the time zone where we're looking at EU, Africa, and the Middle East. Um, but we, we look forward to continuing this dialogue with many of you, hopefully all of you, in 2021. So again, all our best to you, and thank you again for setting aside this time to have this conversation um, with us. Have a good evening. <laughs>